everyone, and welcome once again to the enormous and bombastic comic book vault. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. And it's time once again for new acquisitions. Dan, what do you have on your glass there? Dr. Stephen Strange. This Ooh, that's time. cool. I've never seen a Stephen Strange glass. Yeah, I was very surprised. I found it at a comic shop I went to uh, last weekend. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if Folks watching right now, if you don't know, Dan is the biggest Dr. Strange fan I've ever met, which is not saying much. I don't know that I've ever met more than a couple of big Doctor Strange fans. I like Steve Ditko a lot, so uh, I go for his artwork, especially. That's my favorite stuff, and then all the stuff they do in the 70s and 80s, it's real trippy, is fun, too. Yeah. Doctor Strange is awesome. Well, anyway, if you're watching right now, we want to say uh, thanks for being with us. Good to see you. Thanks for watching live. Uh, Dan and I are doing uh, this show live now weekly, and uh, what we do, if you haven't tuned in before, is we go through our pull list, and we uh, do kind of an um, in-depth discussion on each uh, issue that we read. At the end of the show, we give you our uh, favorite book of the week, and we give you our favorite cover of the week, and then we stick around for 15 or 20 minutes to answer questions uh, and talk about the general comic book uh, environment at large, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So, Dan, are you ready to get right into it? I think so. All right, we got another big week, because uh, we're still in Villains Month, so that means uh, more copious amounts of villain books, although I got a lot more this time than, than uh, Dan, so I will do my level best to, uh, you know, go quickly through mine at the end when, when we get there, because I've got, like... I've got like six extras. I've got a lot this time, so anyway, I will I will roll through those if I can. But anyway, uh, we're gonna start right now with the one that uh, Dan and I both read, and that is Burn Number One. Uh, the first thing I noticed about this, besides the fact that I love the artwork, I thought this was a oh, lot. it's fantastic, Graham Nolan. I think I've heard that name before, but I don't think I've read a full issue by him. And he just yeah. invented Batman in the animated series for me in Spades in this issue. Yeah. Me too. Well, and also in a lot of Nightfall. This is very That's Nightfall. True. Very true. Uh, and, and I love the design of the mask. I mean, I, I, I'm sure Bane has popped up in New 52, but I haven't read anything with him yet. So I really like this Bane design. It's a, it's an interesting cross between comic book Bane, and you're right, it looks a little animated series, which is a lamer Bane. I don't really care for the animated series version of Bane, but the the uh, you know the look of him's okay. And yeah. then uh, and then because of like the 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 pants and he's got these kind of cargo pants and he's and, and uh, because of the combat boots on too. Yeah, the combat boots. There's there's even a little bit of uh, Dark Knight Rises in there. And I, I so I wanted to mention the, the the first thing I noticed reading this was like the first page. Uh, the the voice I had in my head for Bane was the voice that I had when I was reading Nightfall. He just he sounded he sounded like Bane. Right. And then by the second page, it was Tom Hardy all the way. <laughs> I just I, I started at, like 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 just random lines of dialogue. A body at rest stays at rest. I mean like just every <laughs> line. Like I mean, platitudes of advice at his henchmen while he's like killing them and stuff. It's totally Tom Hardy Bane. <laughs> You can't tell me that I... This was Tomasi, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You can't, you can't tell me that Tomasi would have written this much Bane dialogue with just, like, pages and <laughs> pages of monologuing if it had been for Rises. I mean, it's not like Bane was monosyllabic before, but the man has never spoken this much except for in Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, he definitely doesn't sound like the... Um... Mexican uh, dissented Bane with an accent that we're used to from Nightfall and things like that, mm -hmm. um, which is fine because I mean I've read Night some of Nightfall. I haven't read the whole thing, so like you know that's the best Bane stuff. And I wasn't a huge like Bane person just because I haven't read all that stuff before Rises. So th the Bane that I really like and have become accustomed to liking is the the movie Bane. So I was fine with that. Yeah, and I was, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing it for it. It was a little distracting only because I had to kind of switch gears a little bit. But what was right. nice is that it wasn't just that the voice was kind of Bane. Because, by the way, there's a lot of lines that were derived from Rises, too. The man says the word fire no less than three times. <laughs> and he says uh, something rising, and he yes. says... Who says something rising? Yeah, yeah he has a part where he's like, because he, he tells his followers to go take up, and then he's like, it's yours! And he, and he even has, he even has that, that whole uh, movie Bane thing of saying, uh, you know, you know, I, I take like like do this for yourself. Take matters in your own hands. Like he's he's got that whole thing going on. So what I what I really appreciate. I mean, he says you're doing it in my name, but he says remember you're not me. This is also for you. And I like that um, he and, and also he doesn't respect 
anybody who worships him too much like a god. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I think it is interesting uh, because I think the Bane that they're trying to put here is a lot like the Hardy Bane in that he, um, especially in this origin flashback they gave him here, he's sort of like the ultimate uh, enemy of the establishment as they know it in Gotham City. Like, he's all about, you know, the plight of people that are in prison and trying to hand people bootstraps to put themselves up instead of being helped uh, like Batman does with them. Uh, so I, I liked that quite a bit. I, I thought it was, a, it was a really good idea if you're going to do a little bit more of the Rises Bane that, he, it, like I said, it's not just in a little bit of the look and it's not just in the voice. It, he, some of the philosophy is there. Exactly. And, and, and it's cool because um, with with this Bane, you, you get to be completely sure that there's not even another underlying motive. This really is the philosophy. And so I, I don't I don't know, I really appreciated that. But man, this this long um, speech he has at the end is just great writing. Um Tomasi is on his game in this book. I think he's I think it's great. Yeah, and it really excites me. I mean, all of the one shots that I've had Tomasi um, write, I think I actually bought all the ones he wrote just because he happened to work on characters that I liked. Yeah, me too. It excites me for that miniseries he's doing with the Gotham villains, the Vane, the Bane faction fighting against Scarecrow's Arkham faction. Um, for control of the city. That sounds like an awesome uh, thing, especially if the, these characterizations are going to be consistent. Oh, it's a great setup, isn't it? Bane yeah, versus Scarecrow. These are two, two such entirely different sorts of characters. I never would have thought of pitting those two against each other, but I think it'll be really, it'll be a really fascinating sort of thing to do. And 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 yet, uh, they both. Um, you know, command fear, and they use fear as a motivator, but in entirely different ways. And the really cool thing is, between Bane and, and Scarecrow, you've got Bane, who is, uh, who is like, completely self-certain. And then you've got Scarecrow, who kind of hides behind his fear toxin and is usually characterized as a little more insecure. So I wonder how that's going to play in the next story. That's definitely how Tomasi characterized him in the Scarecrow one-shot he did. So I think that's something he's definitely going to pick up on and play with in the, the future with this. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this Bane thing other than what we already said. Um, yeah. Just because it's a very simple story, kind of just like Bane and his freaky cult that's very Rises-esque that follows him around, like cheering him on while he gives, you know, platitude speeches like Rises Bane. It's not a ton of action other than Bane, like, fighting his henchmen to prove their worth or to prove Bane's worth to the people to have the, him uh, as a leader and things like that, so... Yeah, uh, the point is kind of just Bane is terrifying, which yeah. I mean I knew already, but it's effective, I suppose. I I was really uh, sad about the thing with the little girl at the beginning. That hit me in a place, Dan. Yeah, I thought it was. It said a lot about Bane's character, and at the same time provided a great emotional beat uh, for a one-issue story like this. Because um, you, a lot of these one-issue stories. They've been emotionally resonant, but just kind of in flashbacks where we're going to the villain's origin and seeing it from a secondhand perspective. I like that, you know, in the current story that uh, Tomasi was telling, he was able to get a good emotional beat out of it and uh, invest us in, in the story. Um, one the other thing I want to say about this before we move on is how graphic this gets early on. Like, if you're queasy uh, towards comic books when they get kind of violent, don't pick this one up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to read a couple excerpts from the speech that I love so much. Oh, go for it. <laughs> if, if you'll permit me, Dan. Um, Tonight, Santa Prisca's men will carry the power to set fire to this world. <laughs> I mean, really, like it is so rising. Um, but as your leader, I go with only my bare hands to break the backs of all those who have kept you begging for even a morsel. <laughs> Yeah, then, exactly. It's it's perfect. yeah, it's just like that. And then tonight, the spirit of Santa Prisca's yours. <laughs> that was my favorite one. <laughs> How is he not thinking rises when he wrote this book? Anyway, um, I'm recommending this one. It was it was really fun, and um, it's one of those where I don't know that it's got one of the better lenticular covers. I'll I'll say that it's not it's not great compared to well, some. I other. think the uh, Batman background image there is reused and whoever drew the Bane there just they slapped that image over it which is kind of lazy but you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is a little lazy. And you know when I when I when I saw this on the cover I was like, "Oh, that Bane design looks terrible." Then I opened it up and I was like, "That Bane design is great." I so they should have had Graham Nolan do the cover, but Yeah. Anyway. Well, anyway, let's go ahead and move on, shall we? Yes. 
<laughs> no, your line is, of course! Um, let's go ahead. Go ahead and move on to uh, Ninja Turtles number twenty six. Uh, boy, is this involved! There, there, there are. What, I, what I'm, what I'm loving so much about the series, Dan, is that you could put this many minor characters that I never thought would really matter that much in here and make me care about every single one of them. And their relationships with the various clans and families that are at war here. I was really yes. surprised about all that. This book is so involved and has such a strong sense of continuity. I find myself running out of things to say about each individual issue other than just repeating what I've been saying about the story as a whole this whole time. Uh, this yeah. is specifically, uh, not that that's a bad thing. I just think it's a testament to how tightly woven the story is and how consistent it's been throughout this whole thing. I mean, we even have, like, the pizza guy that gives pizza to Michelangelo having an important role in this story here, which, you know, who expected that to happen? <laughs> like, well, you say that it's hard to think of stuff uh, that you haven't said before, though, because uh, this issue, more than some of the others in this uh, in this event, I feel like, not that it stands alone necessarily, but it kind of has its own through line through, through this issue in a way that a lot of the others haven't. There is this kind of running theme of characters... Uh, gaining or refinding old allies in the midst of the the uh, allies that they usually have, either running off or turning evil or getting injured. And all three of the turtles uh, have a friend that, for uh, some reason or, or another, they find a way to uh, kind of bring into this, but not in a manipulative way. It's neat. Uh -huh. You, you have, I mean, you have Michelangelo, you have the pizza guy making up with Michelangelo, who he had wronged him in some way, and he felt bad, bad about it. And I, I kind of feel like he's, he's probably going to fit into this somehow. I, yeah. I, I kind of see that. And then, and then you, have, uh, you have Donatello with, uh, with, with his um, does machines guy from back in the, um, from, from, from back in, in his micro series. By the way, um, did, did you notice, and, and I, I could be completely reading into this and making stuff up, but <laughs> this is where my mind went when I saw this panel. There's a panel of that guy bent over one of his, uh, one of his machines uh, uh, that, that, he's, that he's working on, and he's in the exact same pose that Donatello was in in the 80s cartoon during the does machine part of that line. You're right. He's even got the same goggles on, too. Yeah. And I, the, the only thing I was sitting there thinking was, I was like, I don't know why they didn't make that invention three times taller. <laughs> yeah, because it's huge in the intro, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, the camera pans up it, and it's still going. Yeah, <laughs> but, but anyway, sorry, th that reminded me of that. And then you have um, Raphael on the opposite end of Michelangelo with, uh, with his ally that he's making up with with um, Casey Jones, where he's apologizing for Casey Jones getting hurt because he, he uh, kind of blames himself for it. So all three of them kind of have that. And I have, a, I have a feeling that each of those characters is going to play some kind of a role. And then you juxtapose that with Splinter, who's working with an ally that he probably shouldn't be working with because he's morally compromising himself. Which is an interesting position to put Splinter in, considering all of the... Um advice he's been giving to the Turtles throughout this series about having to um, keep your moral ground firm even in the face of adversity like this. Splinter is sort of contradicting his own philosophy because he's so yeah. desperate to get Leonardo back. And I've been saying throughout the series that Splinter has almost been the most interesting character in the book, and it continues through here. Um, I'm just eat everything up that has to do with Splinter in this, and especially the even the flashback of the, at the beginning with Leonardo oh, yeah. and Tang Shen. Um, would we, as we predicted, there's something going on with Leonardo's past that he and we as readers don't know about, and it's, it'll be interesting to see where it goes, to say the least. They don't reveal anything here, but it's confirmed that there's something going on that we don't know about. I love that he calls her mother, because we haven't really dealt with the, 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 uh, the kind of maternal figure with the turtles yet. That was really cool. Uh, but I, I, I wondered at the end of that, uh, the thing, and, and, I, and I jotted this down while I was reading it, um, even without realizing how morally compromised a position Splinter was going to be in later in the issue. When she tells Leonardo um, I, I, some, uh, someone is responsible for what has happened to you and for the emptiness you feel. Uh, I was wondering at the time, is she, is she talking about Shredder or is she talking about Splinter? And I still don't know. It could be either. That's cool. And you wonder if she's talking about his present state or 
maybe this emptiness was there before, and, and Shredder just activated it. And I him. hope so. I I think that would be that would be a great way to build some dimension for Leonardo, but also it would immediately get rid of the problem I had the last time we reviewed one of these, which was my fear that he was pretty much just brainwashed and we weren't going to be doing any. Clearly, it's a little more complicated than that, and I love that they're making that. That that uh that they're making that obvious to me now because I don't have as I, I'm not I'm not as worried about that as I was. I have to ask you this: I question the splinter thing a little bit. Um, I mean, I mean, like, um, it might ultimately work out just fine. I was just sort of wondering if uh it made sense that Splinter was, and I don't want to I don't want to give everything away, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say exactly what it was that he did. But basically, he does something for Old Hob, and uh that that he he basically commits theft, which is such an unsplinter thing to even consider doing, much less going off and doing it. Um, I wonder if Splinter really thinks that Old Hob is going to be useful enough to him later in helping Leonardo that he uh that he would really go that far. Like, what does he think Old Hob is really gonna be able to do for him? Right, exactly, and there's also the question of, like, if this goes wrong, is Splinter going to try to clean up his mess or not? And how he's going to clean it up and who he's going to involve in cleaning it up with. Well, Frank... Uh, you know, is he going to tell his sons about it? Is he going to keep more secrets from them? It's an interesting moral conundrum for him, and I can't wait to see how he deals with it. Yeah, and, th and that's really interesting. I just hope yeah. that they can make me buy that Splinter would have done this in the first place, because I don't have a concrete understanding of what exactly he thinks Old Hop can even do for him. I think... Um, there was something to, to the degree, maybe last issue we were talking about it a little bit more in depth, but you're right, I can't really um, Unless it's just a brute remember thing, thing where he's like, well, I know I'm going to need Slash to kill a bunch of foot soldiers, and Hob has <laughs> control of Slash right now. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, that's true. Uh, maybe, and then talk for, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Maybe he's thinking about the mutant army that Hob wants to build up, and then maybe that's turtles fight against the foot, but I don't know. We'll have to see. But then how is Splinter okay with that happening? Like, I have a tough time buying that Splinter would, uh, would actually involve himself on the ground floor of creating an army of mutants given, you know, given the moral ambiguity of what both Shredder and Krang have been doing with mutants. Right, very true. Um, so that will all be interesting to see how it unfolds, I'm sure. Um, I'm just really excited to see where that, um, the repercussions go uh, for Splinter in, in that regard, I would say. And then uh, the other thing we should mention real quick before moving on is that uh, we, we, f we finally have some development in the actual war, the, the street war that hasn't quite started yet, but kind of part of it finishes before it even gets a chance to start in this. And yeah, I just love that the Foot Clan is always like four steps ahead of everyone here. It makes them seem that much more intimidating. Like they're not treated as a joke at all in this book, which I love. In many other places, like even the first movie, like they're treated seriously, you know, consistently throughout that movie. But then there's some times where, you know, they're shown to be just completely incompetent because they're teenagers in costumes. Um, I like that the foot is a force to be reckoned with in this series quite a bit. I, I like that. Yeah, no, these are all League of Assassins level guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, like, like I love the position. We've got Karayan at the end. This is one of the better cliffhangers. I was excited. I agree. Um, and I feel like we keep saying that about each issue as it goes along with this series um, pretty consistently through the City Fall thing, if not for the whole series. Um, this just gets more and more interesting as it goes along. I, uh, again, love Santa Luca's art, especially the opening... Um, flashback, the, the panel right after that, where you see Leonardo meditating with the tears dripping down his, his oh, eyes. Like, Man, yeah, that's, that's heart-wrenching, too. Like, yeah, I love that. That immediately got me into it. When I when I opened that first page and he's like, Mother, I'm like, wow, there is no better way to get to, to, to get me ready to read this, this comic book. Like, this is fantastic. It is, it is. Um, man. I just love this book. It's so great. <laughs> I don't want this steady fall thing to end because I'm loving this uh, status quo that we're living in with this book right now. It's, it's so fantastic. Yeah, me too. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we, we beat that horse. We beat that turtle horse to death. Now let's go on to Guardians of the Galaxy number six where we are stretching out the uh, first appearance of Angela in Marvel to its furthest degree. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed this, but... 
boy, it, it's one big giant fight scene that never ends, and I still don't know anything. Like, pretty much what we know right now, the Watcher shows up, which pretty much is there just to say, this is a big problem. <laughs> this is a big deal, having Angela... I mean, I don't feel like I know anything more than I did before, Dan. It seems to me like, basically, the whole deal is... We know time and space is all messed up, and this is a big problem because Angela was in Spawn Comics, and she's not supposed to be in Marvel, so the Watcher is losing his mind. Um, that's, yeah. that's about what I got from this, and that if you break Groot into twigs, he can come back from that. That's what I learned from this issue. I feel like Bendis may be having to meander a little bit with this book just because... Um, it seems like, I mean, we have Thanos involved in this issue here. It's spouting some standard sort of Thanos philosophy at, uh, at a Peter Quill, which is fine if you've never gotten that before, but since we're getting it in, like, every book I'm reading, it seems like it's just a little bit... I got I got it already. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I read that first scene with Thanos, and I turned back to the cover and looked for an Infinity Banner and was surprised right. to see one. I'm surprised. I just think maybe he has plans for Thanos in this book, or plans for these characters with the status quo coming out of the Infinity Event. So he's just sort of stalling for time at this point. I'm not really sure, but I th this is the first Guardians of the Galaxy issue that didn't feel dense or important or interesting to me. Like I the the fight scene at the end of the last issue with Angela and Gamora could have ended there, and I would have been completely fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that it's stretched out to the whole issue here, and there's not even that much dialogue between Angela and the Guardians. I don't think she even says anything to them. Angela says nothing, and it seems like the whole point, it seems like this issue is trying to get away with stretching the fight through the entire thing to prove to us how impossible to kill Angela is, and how she, because they, they make a big deal out of, you know, Gamora can can usually take somebody out with like one or two hits. It shouldn't even be a, a, a fight. It took the entire team to beat her, uh, plus Iron Man, which is kind of funny. Right. And I, and I Star Lord's I, old costume, which was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. But it just seemed like they, 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 the the business was was uh, was working overtime to say, look how uh, like like totally super powerful Angela is, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I got it, you know. And the thing is, if he's stalling so hard, could we not have just introduced Angela post Infinity, unless she's going to have something to do with that event? And I would be very surprised if that happened because I wouldn't think I, so. Yeah. I don't think she's, I don't think she's part of um, of that grand plan. There's no way that he had her in mind when he uh, um, came up with Infinity, right? Right, there's no way, I don't think that Hickman was Hickman, thinking yeah. Angela would be a big part of Infinity. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know, this seemed like a little bit of a waste of an issue. It was, I mean, like I said, it was fun. If you like if you like a giant fight scene through a whole issue, it, it's well choreographed, it looks yeah. cool. But, you know, I've been so excited about Angela. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, let me just say that. I've been so excited about Angela, and I don't feel like I've gotten Angela yet. Like, I'm waiting for characterization. Right now, she's a chick with ribbons. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I have no pre-investment in the character at all, so it was even less of a, like, the novelty was lost on me. So I was just kind of reading this like, okay, they're fighting things. See, that's the rough thing, is I feel like the novelty is going to be lost on most people. I mean, like, boy, if the novelty's not carrying me through anymore, because right. I, was so, I was so stoked to see Angela in this and see what happens with her, and, like, you know... They haven't done anything yet. She's been around for three issues. We've had her in Marvel for, like, two months now, and she's done nothing. Right. I mean, the best thing I can say about this this issue is that Pacelli and uh, Olivia Coypel, who draws the Thanos scenes, fantastic stuff. They yeah. are two of the best artists that Marvel has. I love them. Uh, it's just strange to me, also, I was just looking at the credits, so that, you know, further to your point, this is, uh, they have Neil Gaiman, to some degree, involved in this, and Angela doesn't even speak. I just think it's strange to bring him in to work on this and not have his character say anything. Well, I'm going to say exactly the same thing I said when uh, she shows up at the very end of um, of uh, Age of Ultron, which is they put... Well, actually, his name wasn't even on that. His name was on the first issue she appears in this. I think they're just putting his name on it. I don't think he's doing anything with this. Yeah, I yeah, really... He's he's very funny. Very what could his work... What could his work possibly be? She doesn't do anything. It's like, well, it's like he comes, he comes in to say, maybe he just looks over the script and says, 
yes, she would punch things, kick things, stab stuff, and it might be a problem that she came from one universe and come to another. And nope, I don't have any problem with any of that. <laughs> as long as she's scantily clad and fights things, you have yeah. Angela. <laughs> yeah, he's got like he's got like a list of things: ribbons, check; hotness factor, check; uh, orange hair, check. You know, yeah. Well, uh, she's cute. She's orange. She's not. She's not wearing very many clothes. I'm fine with it. I don't. I don't understand. Yeah, so, I mean, I can't recommend this issue of Guardians very highly or anything. Um, I'm just hoping that it gets better and, you know, not that this was a bad issue. I'm just hoping that it moves along a little bit more with the next one because Bendis' dialogue, especially in the fighting here, it's always fun, the quips and everything. It's just the dialogue wasn't as meaningful. It didn't move the story along uh, as much as I would have liked. Yeah, um, if, if you need... Uh... Um, you know, you're, you're, if, you're, if you have this on your pull list this month and you haven't gone to the store yet and you need an extra $4 because you're anchoring for a hamburger right now, you could skip this issue. You know, it's oh, yeah, you could. All you need to know is that Angela, you know, fights the Guardians and one of them comes out on top. At the yeah. end. And you'll find out who wins at the beginning of the next one anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't mind telling you now. <laughs> right. It's not really that big of a deal, but yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they find they finally subdue her, the end. Uh, you know, uh, spoiler warning. I'm sure no one cares. I don't know, I'm just saying, like, it, it, yeah, yeah. It, could, it could have been, uh, you know, well, I was going to say it could have been a better issue. They could have just not done this one and gone to seven, but called it six. That's all I'm saying. All right. Uh, moving right on. Right along to Ultimate Comics, all-new Spider-Man 20, number 27. We're continuing the Amazing Spider-Man movie homage covers, huh? First the first-person perspective, and now him swinging into the building, like in, in the trailers and stuff. Oh, that's a great point. I didn't even think of that. I still wish we would quit calling it Spider-Man no more, because... He's in costume! <laughs> anyway... Thankfully, it says to be concluded at the end of this one, so we'll lose that banner after next issue, I think. That's great, and as much as I'm kind of enjoying the Cloak and Dagger stuff, this has been a little meandery, and I'm ready for this arc to be over and to move on to something um, a little more Spider-Man-centric. I feel like this is jumping around a lot between different perspectives. I feel like Miles is kind of just here right now, and it's more about Bombshell, who was just introduced last issue, and Dan didn't even really see any business being in the in the book, and then Cloak and, Dagger, Cloak and Dagger, and a little bit with Spider-Woman, um, but isn't it kind of interesting that our two big Bendis books this week, I say big, I think these are our two Bendis books this week, uh, both are kind of a fight sequence through the entire issue. What did you think of this one? I thought this one um, was fun. Uh, I like seeing Ultimate Taskmaster. I like the, uh, the take on him that Bendis has done it is interesting enough to, um, I, I think, at least as a fan of that character, to some degree, take me through the issue. I, I, I like Taskmaster. Whenever he shows up, I think he's a lot of fun. So to see that take on it was fun. That, that was a cool, good uh, thing for me. The the thing that I latched onto the most in this issue was the further development of Miles and Spider-Woman's uh, whatever sort of relationship they have, friendship or otherwise, at this they point. They have a wonderful chemistry. chemistry. They have I, a wonderful chemistry. Yeah, I like them a lot. Um, and it's so interesting because she's like the female version of the legacy Miles is trying to live up to and the man that he's based like this entire crusade superhero thing on, which is really interesting to me. Um, I don't know, th this is a big fight sequence, but I think it further establishes the chemistry with those two enough to carry me through. It wasn't like with Guardians, where I already had a pre-established chemistry that I knew about those characters, and it was just like more of the same and not moving the story. This, I felt like at least furthered the relationships with the characters and fleshed them out a little bit more. So I was a little bit more okay with this as an issue as opposed to the Guardians, where if, if we're going to compare them. Oh, no, absolutely, yeah. The only reason I said that, no, they're, they're totally different things. I just said that because I was a little bit surprised that this, right. this is usually dialogue through the whole thing, and I was yeah, a little surprised exactly. to, get, to get as much action in these books as we got. Yeah, that wasn't a criticism as much, so much. Um, I think, to your point, though, I think one of the things that's with this that you have to always keep in mind is we're heading towards a big cataclysmic ultimate event coming up in a few months, so I mean, this may have, that may have altered Venice's plans if he, you know, um, I'm sure he didn't know that that was happening when this series started. Um, you know, we're 27 issues in now. I mean, he probably had stuff plotted out that he wanted to do with Miles, thinking that he was going to have the Ultimate Universe as it was at his disposal for a little while. So I don't know how much that affected it, but it could be a factor in how this is meandering and slowing down a little bit for you. Well, at the same time, I, I wonder if... 
if even this issue wasn't written before he knew Cataclysm was happening. I, I really get that. I could be wrong about this. I could be totally in left field. I probably am. I was sort of I was sort of reading this thinking, man, if he had if he knew that Cataclysm was coming, maybe he uh, maybe he'd be kind of moving miles along a little faster and give us. Uh, oh. Spider-Man stop before he either gets killed with the rest of his universe or gets thrown over to 616, which I think is a much more likely... That's probably what's going to happen if they destroy the Ultimate Universe. I can't see them getting rid of this character. Yeah. Well, it, um, it, it, am I right about that? I thought I read somewhere that that was definitely happening and that, they, that it's called Cataclysm. And it's I know that there's an event called Cataclysm coming, but I haven't read enough on it to say definitively whether I know that or not. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you might have more information than me. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, and maybe it's not 100% confirmed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would hate to start throwing that around and be wrong about it. Uh, but anyway, but even if that's not come out, they're, they're totally going to destroy the Ultimate Universe. There's no way around that. Like, like I would be so surprised if that didn't happen at this point. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, the thing that distracted me the most from this one, Dan, was uh, just the sheer length of, or, or just how long it took uh, all of the superheroes to finally figure out what Taskmaster's power was. <laughs> yeah, like, I thought that was a little ridiculous. It's like it, it was like he used it two or three times before they were all finally. Oh wait, you mean he can absorb powers? Wait, no, don't no bombshell. Don't do that. He'll blow you up with his ability to suck up your bombshell powers. I'm just like she was standing there watching the entire time. And that's the thing about that character that I find to be sort of. Uh... Uh, not very likable at all is that through this arc she's just sort of been that girl that is totally clueless and is okay with the fact that she's completely clueless and doesn't try to change that. <laughs> I don't know, like, she just doesn't know anything. <laughs> And that's the problem when you're in the middle of a situation like this. Like, well, uh, you're putting on a costume and going into a situation that you're probably going to make worse. So it's not even just the superhero thing. She just doesn't seem like a very intelligent person to me. Yeah. And maybe it's because she's young and naive and she's uh, an overhead. Maybe that's the sort of thing Bendis is going for. But I just don't find the character to be all that enjoyable or endearing or anything like that. Um, I feel like the same. she could have just been... Uh, you know, Cloak or Dagger could have been that character because they're sort of at those two characters are sort of at the same mindset right now, um, at least with what they want to accomplish. They want to go about it different ways, but I feel like if you wanted to make a character that's sort of naive and then you know, a little bit yeah. went behind the years, you could have just used one of the Cloak and Dagger characters. At the same that. time, I, I can see what you're saying. I think maybe, because I'm not saying that I'm liking Bombshell that much, I think maybe the idea is that it's a contrast, where you have Cloak and Dagger as an entity, like don't see him so much as, as, as two different characters, but more as an entity, and then, oh, and, sure. then sure. and then Bombshell is a contrast of that, where they've got more of the mature way of looking at it, and she's got more of the naive way of looking at it, and they both came out of of that experimental science thing where somebody just gave them powers and they got stuck right. with them. Maybe that's the whole idea. I don't think it would have worked so well. I mean, he's not playing that up yet, so I don't really know if that's there, but if that was there, I don't think it would work so well with, um, with one of them being Cloak or Dagger because... I like their chemistry as a couple, and they both I have like to be as mature. They both have to be as mature as they are for that to work. So don't make one of them like Bombshell and Clueless and stupid, because that would ruin what I'm liking about their dynamic. Right. I mean, I feel like you could still have one of them be naive about the superheroing thing, not just the world at large in general. Oh, absolutely, sure. And yeah. I could have worked in that way, but I don't know. As it is right now, I kind of like that they have come together and have decided to work together, so maybe Bombshell will learn a thing or two from uh, Miles and Spider-Woman as we're moving forward here. It looks like Bendis is trying to establish a similar uh, supporting cast to that uh, Peter had in the Ultimate Book before. He was working with the the Human Torch and Bobby Drake and Kitty Pride, and they would go around and fight crime together. Um, I like that this is sort of similar to like the Maximum Carnage team when Spider-Man was working with Cloak and Dagger. I was thinking the whole thing. So that would make this Miles Morales' Spider-Man and his amazing friend, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly, um, which that's is kind of cool. Kind of, yeah, that's kind of fun. Uh, I guess that would make Bombshell Starfire? Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> and Cloak and Dagger together, Bobby Drake. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but, but I, I like that Cloak. I like that Cloak and Dagger um, have the same superpowers. I, I really, I really like that they haven't changed that at all. It, it's exactly the same. Yeah, I. 
kind of resist that sometimes when they ultimatize characters and they're not all that different, but it's just power-wise here. Their personalities are completely different. I find these two, honestly, to be much more interesting, at least, like than what I've read of modern of uh, Six One's Cloak and Dagger. I, I, can read with, a lot of things, but. I can deal with a Cloak and Dagger mini right now. Like, Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I mean, the sad thing is we don't know how long they're going to stick around, but, you know. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, let's add some new characters so that we can kill them in, like, a year. <laughs> well, uh, next up is Wolverine and the X-Men, number 36. Uh, I don't usually review this book, but it is part five of Battle of the Atom, so I, of course, had to go ahead and pick it up because I'm reading uh, this event along with Dan. And this is uh, Jason Aaron, in my opinion, uh, just tearing it up. And I think that this issue uh, is my favorite so far in this event, and is probably one of the most satisfying uh, reveals and cliffhangers at the end of an issue that I've read uh, in Marvel Now uh, overall. Uh, you, I'm not going to reveal what it is, but you get to the end and you find out and you find the reveal, and it was completely contrary to where I thought this was going. I was trusting things that I shouldn't have trusted, and uh, Aaron and Bendis and the other guys writing this are doing a fantastic. We're, we're doing a fantastic job of uh, messing with my expectations. Boy, was that satisfying. I really like that. And also, um, I, 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 there's some, there's a really neat scene with Deadpool in this. I know I brought him up every time we've reviewed one of these because he's had like a funny quip or something, and he's got he's got some of those here too. But he actually gets like a moment, and it's great. Uh, it is, but also, yeah. surprisingly, really important. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. That's 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 the big thing I took from this is the is is, is that last page, and really fun to see uh, present day Cyclops and past Cyclops actually working together for once. That was great. I thought that was great too, and I loved. With this issue specifically, it's been running thematically through, I think, all of the X-Men stuff going on right now. But I think Aaron hits the nail on the head with this event specifically uh, with the stuff that's going on here. In uh, The X-Men since their conception have been a civil rights thing, but it's also, if you go back and read that early X-Men stuff, it was very much uh, steeped in like the hippie culture of the, of the 60s and um, the young... Uh, idealistic uh, youth against the conservative establishment, uh, you know, older generation. And that's definitely going on here in spades. We have, like, old Jean Grey and uh, young Jean Grey uh, mentally battling against each other. Um, Jean Grey's talking about how she should be able to uh, decide her own destiny. And uh, that's been going on, of course, throughout this whole thing with what she's been saying. But... Um, to have it realized physically, or at least as we're shown physically in their mental battle and yeah. all the dialogue that they have there, I thought Aaron touched on all those themes uh, fantastically. Um, the only small thing that I thought was a little bit um, inconsistent with this event uh, is Jason Aaron's Wolverine and Brian Michael Bendis's Wolverine are seem like different characters to me. Uh, Wolver Jason Aaron's Wolverine is a lot more protective of the kids than he has been in Bendis' stuff, and, and not that Aaron hasn't made a good case for it in his, in his book if you've been reading it before, I just think it's a little bit inconsistent to have Wolverine wildly, unabashedly defending the kids in this issue and then in the previous ones. It's, it doesn't seem to be all that much of a concern for him other than... I mean, Bendis' Wolverine just seems like a little bit more like old-school Wolverine, Wolverine to me and how people address him, how people talk to him, especially when Kitty Pride talks to him about how this isn't something that he would have done in the past and things like that. Um, it's not necessarily Aaron's fault. That's just where he's gotten the character um, to a place with his writing. So, I don't know. Yeah. That was the one reservation I had. Wolverine definitely character-wise has the same problem that Batman does in that different writers uh, write him so differently from each other that he doesn't always feel like the same person. And then you put him in an event like this and you have both of the opposing writers having to write him. That kind of thing is going to happen. I didn't like that Wolverine uh, uh, said to Cyclops, I know we're not not friends anymore. I didn't really like that line. I felt like um, I felt like the 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 Wolverine that um, that uh, Aaron was writing in Schism. Um, and I mean, I've got my issues with Schism. You know, the, I, like I love that book, and then I read it again, and I went, "Oh wait, Wolverine's kind of kind of weirdly extreme about about some things in that book." Anyway, um, but. In that book, there was there was a lot of like we we have this mutual trust for each other. We 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 finally figured out how to work together, but we were never really friends. I thought that line was strange. I agree. I think with all the other X Men, 
we were talking about this a little bit um, it, when it, in the previous issues. We thought it was refreshing to see the two X Men teams come together, and like, there's that immediate chemistry between the two of them, even though there's some animosity. They're like, oh, you know, we're working with Scott and his team again, and these people. This is fun because we're getting to have a mutual cause to fight against. And in this issue, all of that seems to go away, and it's all tension again. Um, the situation changes a little bit, but I don't think there's enough of a justification for a 360 turn like that. I agree. It seems a little inconsistent. So, I mean, I think most of our issues are with Wolverine and the consistency, but other than that, I thought the issue was really, really solid. Oh, I really liked it. I My my, uh, my favorite thing about this so far um, as an event has been exploring the idea of... Uh, how the experiences that you have as a person uh, change you and make you into potentially an entirely different person than who you were before, and yet uh, how your nature factors into that too. So you, you're looking at, I mean, this is on a really big grand scale. There are a couple of Star Trek episodes that do this on, a, on, on more of a, of, a, of a microscopic scale that I really love. There's, there's an episode of Next Generation called Second Chances that deals with that, where, you, where there's, a, there's, a, there's a clone of Riker that was made by a transporter accident that Riker finds years later, and he gets to see just how different he is from his counterpart because they've experienced the last seven or 20 years or something entirely differently. Um, and so they turn into different people. Um, and yet there are things at the core that are the same about them. You have that here. So with each of these characters, you can see the things that they... Uh, that, that, that each of them see in, the, in their future selves, and obviously this has already been done with the past selves looking at their present selves. Now, now we've got two generations of it, mm -hmm. and uh, so like, so like uh, everybody's getting a dose of their own medicine now, which is really interesting. And so you've got for for each pair of them, uh, or tr or triplets, I guess, uh, <laughs> you, you can you can see uh, the things where they seem entirely opposite. You know, in, in ways, but then how? But then we can totally buy, I think, how that person could have gotten there based on what we know about them, not just in what has happened to them previously, but also in their individual unique natures as people. And so you got, you know, your your, your classic nature versus nurture thing is there, and um, it, it could have easily been done in such a way where. Uh, where where it was oversimplified and where it was just the novelty of look the people in the future are completely opposite from their past selves isn't this, this interesting it's not like that I I feel like this is Jean Grey even though she's kind of scary and also when we find and I won't give it away but when we find out what her real motivation is for going back in time um, it it makes it makes perfect sense that that's what Jean Grey who has gone through all of this would would do and then you get to the end you got to really wonder just what turned these people into what they are when we finally get a glimpse of their future uh, so interesting oh it's so interesting and it makes you think like the relationships that these new X Men I mean, the X-Men from the past coming into the present have made, like, especially with Scott and Jean fleeing to Magneto's, I, um, Magneto and Cyclops' faction, you got to wonder in the future who they're going to align themselves with now that they're sort of splintering off, and if that, uh, if Magneto's ideological, ideological influence influenced, you know, Jean Grey's decision to come into the past um, with her future self, because there's some things that are morally ambiguous about what she's doing here, which I find to be very interesting. So I'm it, it, it's teasing about future things, but at the same time addressing things from the past. It's all It sounds very convoluted and involved, but the way that these writers are breaking it down, they're making it very character-driven, very organic feeling, and very easy to follow, which is... Oh, so cool. oh it's involved. You know, cer certainly it's that. And I don't even know if I wouldn't say it's sort of convoluted, but almost in a deliberate sort of way, if that makes any sense at all. Convoluted in that you've got the characters within the book going, God, this is ridiculously complicated, <laughs> and how dare you, Hank McCoy, you know? It's like, I really like that. Also, how much fun is Ice Hulk? Ice Hulk is a lot of fun, and I love the running gag that Bobby, like both of them, cannot believe that they're an Ice Hulk in the future. <laughs> And they're trying to figure out how the heck that could happen. He's like, how, how did I become an ice hulk? Uh, that's a little minor quibble of mine. One, one of the Icemen, I forget which one it is, uh, uh, wonders that in a thought balloon. Really, Aaron? Did we have to have one thought balloon in 22 pages? <laughs> all, all right. I wondered about that. Oh, okay. Um, that I don't know. That That's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. I feel like the way we do modern comics, we don't really need thought balloons anymore, but most of the time. But anyway, I don't know. If it's a consistent thing, you do all the time. But, I mean, like, you know, when you've got... Anyway, I don't want to get into it. But just having this many characters, you just suddenly get into one person's head. 
that's weird to me from perspective place. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move on uh, to Uncanny Avengers number twelve, uh, another book that is turning things uh, on or not. I, I was going to say turning things on its head because I wasn't thinking, and that's a dumb thing to say. That's not what I meant to say. What I was going to say is um, I kind of messing with my expectations. Um, you and I, again, I don't know how to talk about this without giving away the ending, but I'll do my level best. You and I keep talking about, wait a minute, is Kang sitting on an invisible beanbag chair? I'm not sure what he's sitting on, but <laughs> let's say it's that because that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I get easily distracted by strange invisible objects. So, um... I, I, I was uh, Dan and I have talked a lot about how uh, the the uh, Kang has his big master grand plan, and Dan keeps saying he doesn't uh, think he knows exactly what it is, and that it's probably more complicated than what he's telling the Apocalypse Twins that it is. And I think that's true. But then uh, you get to the end of this, and um, the Apocalypse Twins have some stuff up their sleeves, man. I mean, like I'm I'm impressed. I thought they were henchmen. There was a totally different thing going on here, man. Like. Ooh. I know. I was brought, I was blindsided. Remender's doing such an interesting thing, having all of these villain plots running concurrently and intertwining. In that, um, I mean, we haven't even seen the Red Skull show up in this book for many, many issues now, and his influence is still all over it. And the two villains that are, or the three villains, I'm talking about, you know, the Apocalypse Twins is sort of one thing because their goals are singular. But um, they're like cloak and dagger. You can look at them as one entity. Right. Very true. Um, and we have his influence in, uh, all over what they're uh, trying to accomplish and the obstacles um, that they're going through. Like, uh, it's revealed in here that Kang uses the, the um, concentration camps for mutants that the Red Skull will set up in the future if this mutant rapture doesn't happen, supposedly, um, to harden them and turn them into the kind of people he needs them to be in order to accomplish his end goal, which I won't spoil what that is because it's revealed in here and it's all yeah. interesting. Um so all of that stuff I find to be fascinating, and I just I love this moral conundrum for Scarlet Witch. Me too. Uh, it's great. Wonder Man. And, it, and Remender took it exactly the place I said last time I thought he would take it, uh, which which excites me because not just because I was right, but because I thought that that, that was the you know the place that you ought to go with it. I mean the the whole the whole um the whole idea of the you know re the redemptive act of I destroyed all the mutants and now I have a chance to save them all even if it's against their will. And that means that there is still uh, some of the, um, the, the, the Scarlet Witch left that is uh, kind of, you know, you know she's, she's self-motivated and she's kind of going not exactly the altruistic direction. And, uh, she's very much like her father, which I, is interesting, you know? Misguided was the word I was looking for. She's still got that, you know? Exactly. I mean, and, like, that's what Magneto, as we touched on before, has been trying to accomplish this whole time, is sort of to create separate societies between the two of them, and now it's possible. And I love that Wonder Man gets involved here, because he's the pacifist. He doesn't want to see these two sides fighting each other, and he gets this chance to use his power to make that happen. And, uh... Good point. Yeah, I wasn't even making that connection, but, uh, yeah. And so it makes a lot of sense to put those two together. But they're both also self-motivated, because Wonder Man knows that if he does this for her, he will be her lover for the rest of his life, and that's what he's been trying to get since he joined the Avengers. That's been, like, his goal is to win that woman's heart. Uh, uh, so, it's very interesting uh, to see these characters, in a way, sort of rationalize these big actions they're taking from a self-motivated place with this philosophy. I mean, I think they definitely have that in the back of their minds when they're doing it, but I, I think it's a little bit more self-motivated than they want to let on to each other. Oh, it clearly is, absolutely, and that's that's what that's what's making it interesting. Exactly. Uh, you know, when, when you it's pretty easy when you're somebody like Wonder Man who's 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 playing up. Uh, you know, look who, how altruistic I am. I'm I'm um, um I'm a pacifist, but it's 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 for it's to further his own goals. I mean, you can be manipulative and a pacifist. You know, that's possible. Uh, so right. yeah. That's, yeah, that's great. You know, I just thought of something when you were talking about um, how, how badly he wants to, to get together with her. Um, how interesting would it be if Remender, uh, within the next um, year or somewhere in this book, were to bring the vision in the middle of this? Oh, that would be fantastic. I wish that would happen. 
I would love that too. I think Remender would write a fantastic Vision too. Um, I think he'd do great things with that character. I haven't seen Vision have to deal with Scarlet Witch since he told her to get the heck out of the mansion. As far as I'm aware of any yeah, other, the, pre the prequel to AVX, that's zero yeah, with you. I remember. AVX, that. Yeah, and and after after that, after his whole, you know, I don't care how much the rest of Avengers thinks 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 you've changed. I can't have you around after what you did. And then after she does what it looks like she's gonna do in this, if it actually happens. And then her possibly being with the Wonder Man, I'd love to see Vision thrown in the middle of that. I'm not a big fan of love triangles, but that would almost be a negative love triangle, if if, if that makes any sense. Um, and uh, you know what I mean, where where like Vision probably wouldn't want to get with her again, but he would also have issues with Wonder Man. And I want to see that. I think that is is the next logical step. I think that'd be fantastic, uh, as well. And uh, man, I am just loving every sort of character interaction that Remender is writing in this book, especially, um, I mean, this is mostly Wanda and um, Wonder Man stuff, but I think he is making a, fa a fantastic case for Alex Summers and the Wasp getting together, too. They have some great chemistry and exchanges in this issue um, that are just feel very natural, and uh, the Wasp is already kind of a naturally flirty character, so I can see her coming out with sort of the, some of the sorts of things that move the relationship a lot, a little, a little fast. Um, I think some of the things she says here, like you know, pointing out the you know the the moonlight uh, view that they have is a little bit romantic. But like the Wasp has like been pining after Thor since she like saw him in the first Avengers issue. Like she's always pining after somebody and um, being flirty with the other members. So I I bought it. I thought it was a really organic sort of thing and spoke to her character quite a bit. So I like that. Um, I love that. Um, also, uh, Banshee is a character that Alex Summers is going to have to deal with in here, too, because he's, you know, an old X-Men character that Alex has a relationship with. Um, I think Remender shows these Apocalypse uh, horsemen very well in, you know, who he plucked from the dead uh, Marvel characters and, and brought back to life. All of them are very appropriate and have um, interesting pre-existing relationships with all the characters. Yeah, and that's the way you ought to do it if you're gonna if you're gonna go with dead characters that obviously will be dead when this is done. <laughs> you right. know, I mean, like that's the only way that you can make that meaningful. Otherwise, again, it's kind of just a novelty sort of thing. Um, you know, I just wanted to uh, put in a quick footnote when you were when you were talking about um, how the wasp is so flirty with with uh, with people. I was um, I was reminded of the original Silk Spectre in Watchmen. That's a very good point. I never really considered that connection before, but yeah, uh, Silk Spectre is kind of like the R-rated version of the Wasp. <laughs> yeah, in a lot of ways she is. Not that that's the only um, you know you know female superhero that's ever been characterized that way, but importantly, on a superhero team almost exclusively. Right. Very very good point. That's an awesome connection. Good on you, man. Well, I've been uh, studying up on Watchmen again recently, and um, that oh, just came. Nice. Up again, so I thought I'd bring it up anyway. Uh, okay, so uh, are, are you cool with moving on? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, again, recommend that series highly. You guys should yes. check it out. Yes, this was this was really great this time, and I, this was starting to lose me a little bit the last couple issues, but I'm I'm way way back on board. Um, and also, I want I want that beanbag chair. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump over to our solo stuff now, and uh, we're gonna do our DC villain stuff. Dan, uh, what do you have? Dan's gonna give us two, and then I'm gonna blow through mine uh, as quickly as I can, and then we'll do our, our last our last few books because I read quite a few this week. So Dan, go ahead and do your first two, and I'll just lay back and enjoy what you have to say. Go ahead. All right, uh, the first one I have is uh, Aquaman number twenty three point two also known as Ocean Master number one. This is uh, co-plotted by Jeff Johns and Tony Bedard with uh, words, as the titles say, by Tony Bedard. And uh, this focuses on uh, Ocean Master a little bit before and uh, after he uh, is broken out of uh, the prison that he's in after the events of the Throne of Atlantis where he was locked up as a prisoner of war on the surface world. And um, there's this great little scene of him in jail where uh, the lawyer's trying to read him his rights and he won't even talk to the lawyer. And the guy's like, don't you want to like stand a, a chance of not going to death row? And he's like, I do not comply with your surface world rules. And like basically the, the whole point of this is sort of pointing out how um, ethnocentric uh, Atlantean uh, culture is from Ocean Master's perspective and how um, he just has this deep hatred for the surface world because of their um, abuse of the planet and, and things like that. Um, but, but the interesting thing about this one is 
Ocean Master's portrayed at the end as having some sort of redemption for him, which is very contrary to all of the villain books so far. Like, wow. there's this little scene where he's about to go back in the water and retake his throne, and there's a bunch of humans getting, uh, you know, a child and in, in her, in, uh, his mother uh, about to get... Uh, you know, either beaten, raped, or killed by these uh, looter people that are just insane and going around and doing that to a bunch of people. And uh, Ocean Master can't turn his head. He goes back and runs and gets them, and that's the cliffhanger of the issue. So uh, I really uh, liked that this was... This surprised me, because it wasn't just the kind of let's, uh, you know, revel in the evil that is Ocean Master for the whole issue. Like, he's definitely a racist and ethnocentric kind of guy, uh, but there are some redeeming qualities about him, which I found to be interesting. Um, sort of reaffirming the comparison I've always made with this character is he's like he's the Loki of the DC universe, um, which is you know maybe why I like him so much as a villain. Uh, so yeah, I'll recommend this one uh, if you've been reading Aquaman so far. It's a pretty good addition uh, to that story because it you know tells you where Ocean Master has went since he's been locked up in that uh, crossover. So if you like uh, Aquaman, this is definitely one you you probably want to pick up. You know, I want to point out real quick that if this whole villains thing had been done two years ago, I mean, I know a, a, a villain thing was done a few years ago or something, but I mean, like, if this very thing was done two years ago before, like, like pre-52 when Aquaman didn't get a book yet, we would not have gotten Aquaman villains in this. No, we wouldn't have, and I'm so glad that we did, because... Um Especially with Ocean Master and Black Manta, I'm not a big fan of much of the other uh, Aquaman rogues, but those two specifically, I, they're great villains. I love them when they're written well, of course. Um, so I'm going to move on to my second one, and uh, this is the first Green Lantern book I've bought in a very, very long time because he wow. has been the star of that book forever, and I have no interest in that character. But when Sinestro is the star, I am there because Sinestro is <laughs> awesome. Uh, I was reading a little bit of uh, Green Lantern when uh, 52 started because it was uh, a buddy cop thing written by Jeff Johns uh, between Sinestro and Hal Jordan, so at least I had um, Hal Jordan uh, bounced off Sinestro, so he was he was fun in that way, and Sinestro is just a fascinating character to me. Uh, to make a comparison to the Marvel villains again, he is to me like the Magneto of the, of the DC Universe in that he's this guy that's trying to do good, and he has a perception of what he wants... Um, to accomplish, which is basically a utopian society in his home world. He wants, you know, world peace and all those sorts of things. He wants good for his people, but uh, the problem with Sinestro is that he lives in the past and he believes that an authoritarian uh, government is the way to achieve that and to control the people through fear and to force them into that sort of peace. Um, and that's what this book is all about, is sort of chronicling the history of Sinestro and how he used to be his, a historian and how he wanted to bring back the old ways of his people, sort of similar to how General Zod uh, was portrayed in, the, in that one shot. And... Um, it talks a lot about uh, what he did to uh, Korrigarian society and um, how the people were just living in constant fear of this oppressive uh, state government. And I think it's it's a very um, it's a very interesting um, thing to explore, especially in our uh, you know modern day where governments have the ability to spy on their citizens and are doing it openly and things like that now. So it's an interesting uh, subject matter to talk about. Um, through the guise of this kind of, you know, goofy, light, uh, you know, color spectrum kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, just because I'm not all that familiar with the ins and outs of every Sinestro origin story, so I got the gist of uh, the ideas that I wanted to know about the character in here, which was cool. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to pick this up was because of the creative team as well. I just wanted to briefly mention that. This is Matt Kent and uh, Dale Eelstrom. Uh, Matt Kent is doing a uh, Peter Parker uh, Marvel Knights Spider-Man book soon, so I wanted to see what kind of writing chops he had, and that's another reason why I wanted to pick this up, and I, I enjoyed this quite a bit. So that excites me a little bit more uh, when Peter Parker gets that uh, series that he'll have a you know quality writer uh, on his hands. So, yeah, I'd recommend this one too if uh, you're a Green Lantern fan and you aren't... You don't know everything about Sinestro, or you don't mind going back and re-examining that stuff through a different lens, I suppose. Um, this is a good time. I, I liked it quite a bit. Okay, I'm going to run through my gauntlet now. I had uh, six villain books this week, and uh, like I said, I'm going to do these as quickly as I can. Some of these I have very little to, to say about, so I'll, I'll just mention a couple things. Uh, the first one I have is Joker's Daughter. This is uh, Dark Knight 23.4. I, I started thinking about... Um, 
had a conversation this week with Bill at the comic shop. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention Elite Comics at the beginning of the show like I usually do. That's the comic book store that helps us out with the show. And Bill um, and I were talking about this, and I said, why, Bill, why do you think that they went with uh, like just a few of the titles and did the point thing instead of doing one for all of the, of the 52 titles since they're doing 52 books? And he said, well... Um, it's for the sake of, and he's right about this, I don't know why I didn't think of this, he said, it's for the sake of collectors that have to be completists, so that no matter who the character is, if you do .1, .2, .3, .4 on a book that a big collector is reading, they're going to have to get all of them and put it in their pull list. I mean, I mean, and put it in, oh, in. I understand the that's, marketing strategy now. That's the marketing strategy there. Yep, he's absolutely right about that. And I just looked at him and I said, well, considering the fact that in my pull box, each of the points for the books that I was reading you put in my box, you must be making more money. <laughs> um, that's funny, but I mean, it, it makes sense that, 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 he's, that he's doing that because it technically is in the roster of the title. It's not, you know, not his fault. Uh, that's what they did. But anyway, at least um, for Dark Knight and for Batman, um, some of those other ones, you know, I kind of wanted all of them anyway, so that's cool. But um, sure. I guess but I guess their marketing strategy worked because I'm sort of like that, collecting myself a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes. So anyway, um, that's what happened there. Uh, so I, I just want to throw that out there. Joker's daughter. Um, ah, boy, I, I, I gotta tell you. I, I, oh boy, I want to listen to this one. This is gonna be fun. I I, I don't know what what I what I felt about. I, I'd say I was really uncomfortable reading this, and it wasn't the it wasn't the good kind of uncomfortable because not only was it just um like like really wrong, uh, but it. It was also a super super contrived story, and I didn't buy a lot of what was going on in it. So it was like it was like making my screen my skin crawl at the same time as it wasn't really earning my suspension of disbelief. Um, I mean, like you've got this girl who runs off and is kind of homeless, and she's by herself, and she is sort of obsessed with anything she sees as being ugly. That's her whole thing. She seems to have the psychosis where she's obsessed with ugly things, and she thinks she thinks um, things that are gross are are pretty in her in her mind. She has like that like like the, like the idea of that totally flipped. So even though uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or this beholder, the grosser you and I would think it is, the, the prettier she would think that it is. Okay, okay, that's her whole thing. And um, so her her back story with uh, her parents and whatever is um, basically that her that uh, something was kind of wrong in her head and she was like constantly wanting to like uh, hurt animals and do really wrong kind of creepy things like that and her parents didn't know what to do with her and um, you know they kept trying to make her life better and make her a better person but it never worked and so eventually she uh, just runs off. I don't know if she kills them or what exactly happens um, but uh, she basically she messes up her own face and I, uh, you know, you know, tries to look all, all, all gross and stuff, and then she's like, she's like, ugly is the new pretty, and then uh, she just, uh, she runs off. Oh, this, that, that's what it is. She, it, it's one of those things where she's telling these people like what happened to her, but she's kind of giving the facts differently than what we're seeing in the flashbacks, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, so she says, my family sent me on vacation, but she actually ran away. Okay, how clever. Anyway, uh, but what, what I, what I found really, um really disturbing about this is that um, she's kind of I just don't think she's very interesting because she seems to just have this really like like drastic dramatic psychosis that she's never been treated for and I don't really understand why her parents never tried to treat her for it but then again she's somewhat of an unreliable narrator so I can't really tell exactly what what exactly her past is anyway so she anyway so what happens is this is where the really contrived part comes in she basically the only reason we're supposed to care about this character is because a at the end of this she goes uh, uh, she goes from the sewer in, in, into the surface world and she's going to um, try to kind of um, amass a big cult and do scary, bad, evil things, but also because they put the name Joker in her name. I mean, that's really the only reason we're supposed to care. And the, and it, the really contrived thing is she is already wearing purple. She's already scarred her face up. 
She's already wearing a shirt that says Daddy's Girl. By the way, the Joker never appears in this. She's she's uh, she's got a like everything you see on the cover. She's already wearing. She's got um, underneath her shirt. She's you can see a little bit of, of of Ha written there. So she she's written Ha on herself, and this is all already there before she f happens to find the Joker's face in the sewer and put it on her own face. Really. And there, there's no mention of her being, like, obsessed with the Joker or anything like that before that. But then all of these, like, like, like uh, sewer dwellers in this weird, um, like, like uh, homeless community that's like this patriarchy where they kind of they put all the women down, um, they all think she's the Joker at first, and then they kind of like, treat her like the Joker, like they're all scared of her just because she's wearing the Joker's face. And I just kind of wonder, just because she's got the face he ripped off, put on her face, how you would even recognize that as the Joker's face, as old and gross as it would be now. I, I don't really get that. So yeah, basically what happens is she um, she kind of turns this patriarchy into a matriarchy and uh, and uh, gets all these women to follow her and they put all the men down and um, and then they create this uh, this kind of um, this kind of gang. Uh, that's that's what happens. It, it didn't it didn't work for me at all. I, you know I what really annoys me about what you're describing there. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm finding it hard to describe, to be perfectly honest with you, but yeah. It sounds to me like they're doing that thing they did with the villain in the Catwoman movie where they're like, oh, a villain who's a girl, she has to be obsessed and be vain and with her appearance, you know? And, you know, she perceives ugly as being pretty, so her motivation is, I want to be pretty because she's a girl. It's like, come on. Like, women are three-dimensional people, too. <laughs> well, they even have this thing where she says, you know, girls always want to be pretty, but that's really shallow. I'm like, well, what you're doing is just the opposite of, is the, just the opposite, it's just yeah, as shallow. Exactly. It's, uh, it's the same, it's the opposite like extreme. I didn't like that. The other thing, too, is I don't know how this character could possibly begin to be interesting until the Joker actually shows up in her story. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think that the Joker has to be involved before I care about her in relation to him. Like, really, what are the odds she just manages to find his face and knows what it is and is already wearing it? I, what am I missing here? Like, I don't know. I don't get it. I just Why? don't. Is she like the bi biological daughter of the Joker? No. She's just this random girl that found his face. That's what I'm saying. That's really strange. So, unless she is, is and we don't know it. on the name. But like basically, that's why that character exists, just to cash in on the Joker's name. That's exact. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound like something I want to read at all. <laughs> No, so anyway, I don't know. If anybody got any more out of it than I did, uh, feel free to you know write in the comments and, to, and and tell me what's going on in this that I'm missing because I really I don't get it. I just like like anyway, it was it was weird and um you know just and like I said you know disturbing is fine if it earns it and I'm and I'm you know like like invested but it, it, I wasn't so anyway uh. Man bat I was surprised to kind of like actually uh, nice. although. This one is is not a very a very a very dense story. Uh, it's kind of more about the you know sort of like what Vince and I were saying about the uh, Man Bat episode, uh, the, the the first one in in the uh, Batman the animated series. Actually, it's kind of more about the visual aesthetic. I uh, like 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 the art in this is really cool. Is really cool, and I love all the action in this. It's great. And uh, basically, what you get here is you get um you get Man Bat. Uh, trying to be a hero. Uh, he, you, you've got Langstrom, who is uh, trying to stop his uh, his his uh, ex-wife, who has uh, gotten her hands on the formula herself and is using it for devious means, and apparently always wanted wanted it. And that had a lot to do with why she was even with Langstrom in the first place, which is really interesting. The serum digger. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, she's the evil. She's actually kind of the evil man. She's she's the she bat they call her here. And Langstrom um, uh, is is uh, is trying to uh, stop her. But then also with all of the horrible things going on with all the superheroes gone, he's trying to take the place of Batman, which is kind of interesting. Cause he's man bat. Yeah, but of course he's terrible at it because uh, in his man bat form he can't completely control himself, and so he every time he tries to 
stop a crime, he eviscerates the criminal, and he's like knocking people's heads off. And there's blood everywhere, and there, there's this part where uh, where he tries to save some people or, or stop a mugging or something. I forget what it is. He, he tries to stop something something bad from happening, and uh, the police show up, and Gordon is there, and he and he says, "No, don't shoot! I'm the hero." And Gordon just looks at the at the slaughter, and he says really? And then they start firing at him. Uh, but anyway, there's not a whole lot else going on in this, except it's it's uh, it's a, a series of events of Man Bat trying to be a hero and not being very good at it. That's pretty much it. But I enjoyed it. That's good to hear. Um, that was one that I was a little iffy on picking up, but maybe um, since you said, said it's pretty good, maybe I'll give it a look eventually. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be real satisfying for people, because it, it, it's kind of just an introduction to what this character is right now, but uh, he's going to be in Detective Comics soon, apparently, according to the end of this, so, you know, um, you, you, oh, cool. like, just based on, I don't know, like, like I, I would, I suppose I would recommend this, but just based on me saying, he's kind of interesting, he's kind of fun, um, if you're, if you're wanting some Batman, maybe he'll be great in Detective, I don't know. Um, moving on, Metallo, uh, this is Action Comics 23.4, I really didn't care for this, and I didn't get a whole lot out of it. Um, Who's the creative team on that? I'm curious. Well, this is... Uh, oh, no, that was Greg Pak again, because he was on, on action before. No, this is Charlie Fish. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, Steve uh, Poog is, is the artist, who, who does a fine job, but uh, I don't know, I think part of the problem, I, you know, honestly, I probably shouldn't even read this, because part, part of the problem is, I, I, was, just, I, was reading, I was reading all the Superman ones, because I was liking so many of them. Right. The thing with Metallo here is uh, I didn't really care for Metallo in action already. Like, I didn't really like it. Metallo, I remember when he showed yeah. up, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, in, in this, he's this uh, government guy who gets all souped up with this, uh, um, you know, metal suit and that he's kind of stuck in and stuff, and uh, it, he kind of just goes haywire and crazy, and what happens in this is he finally gets fixed by the government. He, the one thing that is interesting about it is that he's kind of Sam Lane's pet project. So Sam Lane is, uh, is, is obsessed with getting this guy fixed up and back in the field and I, I like 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 I kind of hides behind I care about this guy as a man but you can never tell how much of it is he appreciates the man for his service and how much of it is um, you know he's a, he's, he's kind of my super soldier you know he's kind of my pet project oh, so right. well, those things are at odds I like the Sam Lane stuff in this and I have liked Sam Lane a lot in New 52 because I like his take on sure. Superman I think it's really interesting yeah um, I, I like him as kind of a um, a, a juxtaposition to uh, Lex Luthor's view. Uh, you, you, you know, these, these two negative views that are very different from each other. I like that a lot. He reminds but, me a lot of General Ross, and I, that's a character I like a lot. So Yeah, he is a lot like General Ross. That's, that, that's a good point. What, what you have here is Metallo uh, getting put back in the field and solving every uh, problem by killing everything. So, like, like there's this there's this part where uh, there is like a hostage situation, and his whole uh, solution is blow up the hospital. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, and then General Lane is like, "Well, I, you know, we can't have that. I, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think the the American people are going to do anything but revolt." If we're letting this happen, so uh, he he uh, puts together a plan to try to uh, kill Metallo, which at that which he doesn't want to do, but he has to. And at that point, I think he's totally justified. I uh, right. you know he's the, the guy's blowing up hospitals. What are you gonna do? And then <laughs> yeah, it was it was That's not crazy. so extreme. And then it just gets preposterous because uh, Metallo's like like uh, Metallo survives it. it. It's like a plane. Explosion, and he survives it, and then he goes after General Law, uh, General Ross, General Ross. He's he is now just General Sam Lane Ross. G General General Lane, um, he's like, he's like, uh, uh, you know, you know, how dare you? You betrayed me. I'm like, you're blowing up hospitals, dude. <laughs> so then, so so, uh, so as far as I can tell, his mind has been completely corrupted by the suit. He's not really a person anymore. So I don't care. That's that's really how I felt about it. Wow. And um, that's pretty much that's pretty much what happens in it. He he's trying to get revenge on Ross, and he wants to serve Ross on Lane. And <laughs> I'm he wants sorry. To, you're fine. And he wants to get he wants to get his revenge on Superman when Superman finally comes back and all of that. But there is this kind of uh, I'm gonna spoil this. So um so, so, sorry for folks that you know are. <laughs> Really, uh, anyway, I'm sure nobody's gonna mind this this little thing. But uh, you get to the end, and um, he's teamed up with Scarecrow, so that is kind of interesting. Oh, that's uh, interesting. I wonder yeah. if he'll be in that uh, Batman mini or not. What it means is that we'll get to see Bane versus Metallo. 
That's awesome. So that could be cool. I just don't like this Metallo. I, I mean, I know, I know Corbin was always kind of a soldier character, but it's, I don't know what it is with him here. He's so one-dimensional. There's nothing to him. There's just yeah, nothing to him at all. It sounds like a militant guy taken to, like, the extreme that, like, so much so that no person could realistically ever think like that. <laughs> Yeah. So if he's like, if he's thinking that way, and he didn't, if he used to be like that, then who cares? And if, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if the suit is just doing it to him, then who cares? The next one is Parasite. This is Superman twenty three point four. I don't have a great deal to say about this one. Uh, basically, the th this is doing that kind of classic supervillain thing of he was already what he is as a supervillain before he was a supervillain, except with, with, without power. So in a metaphorical way, he used to be a parasite on society, and now he's a physical parasite. Okay, no, that's fine. And so uh, there's all these kind of neat panels. I, I like I like what it what what this issue does. Visually, there's all these panels where we see him uh, walking into various places before he's Parasite, and everyone behind his back is calling him names. And we keep seeing the names that they're calling him, uh, uh, like 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 plastered in purple across panels as he's walking around, and it's kind of foreshadowing what he's going to turn into. And I, 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 I sort of like that. And um, yeah, that then cool. then uh, we we see his. Uh, uh, his his kind of origin, um, where he gets in uh, some kind of crazy uh, um, accident. I forget exactly what it is. He gets he, he gets into this. Uh, oh, he gets into this accident with this uh, giant green creature thing in the middle of Metropolis. His whole thing is 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 how much like he totally hates Metropolis, uh, and he has interesting reasons for it. Um, and then he gets. Uh, it's kind of a double um, accident because it's like he gets. He gets in this accident with this creature, and then at first it doesn't seem to be doing anything to him. And then that mixed with getting electrocuted later in, in a, at that hospital or a doctor's office or something, um, then that turns him into parasite. There's there's a, there's kind of some neat. Metallo didn't try to blow up the hospital he was in. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this there's this neat line uh, uh, toward the end where where he gets um, finally picked up by Superman. And by the way, there's nothing about Parasite in the present right now. This is all backstory, and he's, he's pretty... Oh, so it's sort of like the Bizarro one. I, I don't even know if... Has Parasite even shown up in 52 yet? Yeah, yeah. well, I think maybe he did, because we see him... I mean, I just haven't read all of Superman. We, no, we see him, we see him uh, get get uh, beaten by Superman in this. Um, oh, okay. Now, his powers are kind of neat, because he's he, he's not just a life sucker. He also uh, steals powers, so he, he gets Superman's heat vision at one point. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I don't know if he's ever been characterized like that, but they, they do that here. And then um, at the end, there's one line that really stuck out to me that I really liked. He's got this line where um, he he uh, he's in a he's in prison and they have to feed him energy because that's what he lives on. But he he's he's only able to uh, get nine volt batteries, and he says it's like living on rice cakes. I thought that was a good line. <laughs> that's fun. Um, Moving on, uh, real quick, Killer Croc. Uh, this is Batman and Robin, 23.4. The first thing I noticed about this is Killer Croc is way too eloquent for Killer Croc. I was really surprised by some of the narration in this, some of, wow. some of the weird toys. I was like, wow, that is the most poetic Killer Croc I've ever read. He's and like I, a Tom Hardy Killer Croc. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, you know, the sewer is yours! And I thought maybe uh, uh, a point was maybe going to be made with that where he, he really was was smart, but because of what he looks like, nobody nobody buys it, you know, that sort of thing. Right. But then it's inconsistent, because there are places where he starts talking with, with kind of more of a slang, and more of, more of a grammatically incorrect sort of thing, so I'm not sure what was being done there, uh, if, the, if, if the eloquence was intentional or not. And uh, who wrote this? Because I know Dan's going to ask me who wrote this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking for it. Hold on, I'm sorry. I, I don't know... Go ahead and ask me, Dan. Go ahead and ask me who wrote this. Who wrote this? Oh, well, I'll find out for you, Dan. It looks like it was Tim Seeley, and it was uh, drawn by Francis Bertella. One of the one of the small criticisms I just want to jump in with the, with the Villains Month books that people have been making that I think is completely valid, there are no credits for the creators on the covers of any of the books. Yeah, oh. that's been bugging me, too. I just think it it speaks volumes about what DC has priority wise. You know, I think you know they're saying the characters are a little bit more important than the people that are actually working on the books creatively. I think you're absolutely right about that. That's problematic. 
Um, so this killer croc is the one with the skin condition. Uh, he is he is he's born. Um, well, well, we don't actually see anything about his birth, but when he's a teenager, he's got the skin condition, and the woman raising him, who's not his mother, um, which is kind of important for the story because she doesn't care for him the way that a mother would, and she keeps trying to get him to look normal by scrubbing his scales off, which is like really terrible. Yeah. Uh, because he, you know, because obviously, well, it hurts, and she just keeps calling it grime or whatever, and it's actually part of his body, and she, he's supposed to scrub it off. So that's yeah, that's awful. So I mean, from from, from very early, he's being told that um, he's not he's not good enough. You know what what he looks like. He's he's going to get eaten alive in society, and he has to try to blend in and look normal. Well, as he hits puberty, as he gets older, he turns into buff, crazy killer croc, and that's <laughs> never going to happen. And he, you know, he wrestles alligators for a living, but he's he's taken advantage of. By this uh, this circus type guy, it's not really a circus. It's more of a it's more of a modern day sideshow kind of thing, if there is such a thing. And uh, anyway, so he's uh, so like he's not paid what he's supposed to be paid because this guy takes advantage of him because he's got nowhere to go, that sort of thing. And um, ultimately, he. Uh, he, he's doing somewhat of what Clayface is doing. There's a little bit of, of, of um, kind of the same thing going on, although it's a little more interesting than Clayface, uh, where he's trying to prove that he can, um, you know, be, that he is as smart as any other supervillain. And by the end of this, he actually amasses um, his own big crew, and he has his own gang. It's like every villain in, practically every Batman villain in New 52 uh, has their own gang, you know? But... <laughs> That's, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where they went with they went with that. Um, it's uh, it's okay. I, I just don't have a great deal else to say about it. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Lukewarm recommendation on Killer Croc, and then finally Doomsday. Um, I can't wait to hear what you say about this one because I know how uh, near and dear Doomsday is to your heart. Okay, here's my thing with Doomsday. Yeah, I don't understand this. <laughs> Imagery wise, iconography wise, it made me giddy because it kept calling back to death of Superman. So yeah. it was it was turning me into a little twelve year old fanboy. <laughs> but it doesn't make any sense. Well, I don't even know that it doesn't make any sense. I don't know what's going on in this. Okay, I don't know where Doomsday comes from. It's all Kryptonian stuff. The entire thing takes place on Krypton. There's no present day whatsoever. We don't even get a sense that Doomsday will ever even show up in Fifty Two. This was put out. So that people like me who collect Death of Superman would buy it. And that's how popular Death of Superman was. They know there are enough of us that they could put this out. It have nothing to do with anything and we would buy it. Um, that's really I, strange. Well, I, you know, I collect, I do, I collect Death of Superman, so I bought it, and, um, yeah, it, it, first of all, the art is pretty. I mean, it looks fan, it's gorgeous. And that's why I was kind of geeking out. Um, where, uh... Where is it? I mean, really, just look at him, dude. It's gorgeous. That's awesome. It looks fantastic. The art here is by uh, Brett Booth, who I don't know who that is, but I might look him up he after does, this. He used to do Teen Titans um, when the 52 started. He's the guy that okay. made the uh, Vulture Tim Drake costume. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I, I, I mean, you can't be perfect or anything, but, I, but I, I, I love what he does here. And then there's this great, like, black costume Superman thing uh, that doesn't make any sense, but it looks great. Look, I mean, just look at this. It looks great. Oh, I love the black Superman costume. Here's, here's what happens. Doomsday attacks Krypton in the past, were given a story about it, and apparently it was partially unleashed by Zod. So you at least have a cool callback to the uh, Zod one-shot, where Zod's talking about how he's a necessary monster. And Doomsday is the necessary monster that he unleashes for whatever reason he unleashes it. We're not really told, but, um, but Zod is responsible. It looks like Doomsday might have a great deal to do with why he was sent to the Phantom Zone in the first place, which is also very interesting. Oh, that's cool. What I don't like about it, what I don't get anyway, is we're not told where Doomsday comes from. I don't know if they went to the the homeworld that he originally came from and found him and managed to somehow take him uh, into custody because 
you know, that should be hard. Uh, but then again, remember that there was no off-world travel for a long time on Krypton, even in 52, as far as I know. So I don't know how that happened. Anyway, I don't know where he came from. I don't know if he was created on Krypton. I just don't know. Um, we're not told. And what's annoying about that is... Um, Remember that the ripped up shorts that Doomsday is wearing is part of a larger costume. We always forget this now uh, when, when we bring Doomsday back. So he's got the shorts and they're ripped up, but there's never anything about the suit he had before. And he just shows up looking like that. That's stupid. He had a suit, you know. He, he ripped, he, he ripped out of it when he was fighting Superman. That's that's why he looks like this. But because he's got to be recognizable, so that people like me will buy this. Uh, but people like me who know who Doomsday is, they could put him in full costume you know, on the cover, and we would know what it was. So I don't understand that. Anyway, I'm being a fanboy right now, and I realize that, and I apologize to everyone, but it's annoying, because I don't understand what the point of this issue is. There's all of this talk like it's a prophecy or something about the, like, Kryptonian knight that will fight Doomsday and be killed, but he will ultimately kill Doomsday in the fight. But then that's talked about somehow as ha having happened in the past. But it's also talked about as having been off-world, like it's on Earth. I don't know if this is a premonition, I don't know if it's a prophecy, I don't know if it's something that happened already somehow, I just don't know. And ultimately, this is here for the artwork and not for the story. I, I hope something is done with this. Um, the place to do it would be in Supergirl, because uh, because Kara is all over this. Uh, young Kara, um, like pre Kara, oh, wow. and she's great, and, uh, and, and, I, and I love her in this. It's, it's great, but I just don't get the point of Doomsday in this, except as a plot device for Zod. Now, I'm not complaining that Doomsday is a plot device, because Doomsday was always a plot device. <laughs> right. I don't know where the black costume Superman thing comes in. I don't get it. Anyway, I have no idea. Um, right. But, I'm still going to recommend it on just, if you like looking at Doomsday, it looks great. It's so, so pretty. Um, anyway, I was, like, like, like my, uh, my, two, my two sides of my brain were completely at odds reading this one. That sounds like one of the strangest reading experiences I've heard you talk about in a long time. Like, I, I can't even, like, pin how I feel about how you feel about that book. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, anyway, so I'd like to apologize for all, the, for all the yelling, and I will now move on to Dan. Uh, Dan, what else do you have for us, man? I have two solo books left, and uh, the first one I'm going to take a look at is Scarlet Spider, number 22. Uh, this is the awesome cover portraying Kane being stepped on by one of my all-time favorite Spider-Man villains, who was revealed to be the mastermind behind uh, Kane's recent uh, debacles in his life, uh, like the scarring in his face and things like that. Um, so we have Craven uh, sort of systematically going around and destroying everything about Kane's life and trying to drive him. Uh, and motivate him into becoming the sort of killer uh, type person that he was before he took up the Scarlet Spider mantle, because uh, in previous uh, Spidey lore, uh, Kane had been sacrificed to bring uh, Craven back from the dead uh, by the Craven family accidentally. So now Kane is the only one that can provide Craven the rest that he's looking for, because Craven wants to die. And Craven's last hunt, as we know, famously shot himself in the head, and his family wanted. Uh, to bring him back because they they misinterpreted his final wishes and Craven is all angry about that. So that's Craven's whole thing now is now that he's back alive. He has his death wish that uh, he wants to uh, go out honorably, and that's what this issue is all about. Is sort of Kane and the two sides of his personality at odds. Um, it's uh, sort of culminating all of the thematic stuff that's been going on in the book so far. Uh, very uh, well, and I think it's bringing it to a nice conclusion. Uh, this is, of course, Yost and Burnham again writing this. And, uh, yeah, this is going in a direction that uh, is really interesting, and uh, it's left ambiguous in this issue as to uh, some of the things that have uh, happened to the supporting cast, whether or not they are all dead. So, especially since this is being canceled, uh, that's keeping me on the edge of my seat, uh, because... It's not like Peter Parker's supporting cast where those characters are indisposable and we don't want to kill too many of them off all at once because, you know, we, we brought back some of them like Harry Osborn and, you know, they were going to bring back Gwen at one point. But these characters are completely disposable because they're in Houston and this book's getting canceled. So the stakes are very high. They feel very high. And I like that about this book especially. Um, the characters aren't, like, killed off for no reason. It's given emotional weight and resonance in here uh, with what Kane decides to do. So, yeah, this is a uh, really well done issue and probably one of the best of the series so far. I really, really liked this. 
Has Yost ever at any point in the whole run of that book fallen back on the obligatory Houston we have a problem joke? I can't remember, but he probably did at least once. <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to ask you about that, because it seems like, uh, anyway, well, hey, Dan, I'm glad, ago, yeah. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you enjoyed that, because we all knew how much you were craving some Craven. Oh, I am always craving some Craven. <laughs> that, is, that is a 24-hour-a-day kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wrong. I just wanted a moment of silence for how wrong that sounds. Okay, moving on. I really like Craven the Hunter as a villain, people. <laughs> I just I have a 24-hour fixation. Okay, um, moving right along. Okay, uh, so I want to warn everybody before I start with this one, and I, I won't go on about this too long, that this this is going to be a little bit of a gushy review on my part because of just how much I enjoyed this. This is probably the most fun with the comic book I have had all year long. Uh-huh. Um, the, yeah, I just like, and I'm biased because this is one of my favorite things, and and I have an irrational love for this property. <laughs> I was I was so stoked when I found out IDW was doing this, and it came out, and not only did it not disappoint, it blew me away. So understand how high my expectations were for this book, and how wonderfully fantastic it was. This is Powerpuff Girls number one, and I uh, just look at the cover. Just look how great that cover is. Awesome. <laughs> This is this is the uh, this is a variant cover. This is the subscriber cover. Uh, I actually had the other cover in my box, which was just uh, a, a, a big blossom head with uh, with, with um, mojo over it, which looked great. But then uh, Bill had this one there, and I was like, "Can I have that one instead?" And he was like, "Yeah." So anyway, uh, and of course, he tried to me to get, to get me to get both, and I, I was a little tempted, but ultimately I didn't do that. Uh, anyway, moving right along. Um, this is hilarious, and it's also wonderfully well drawn. Uh, this is done by uh, somebody I don't know, but somebody I'd like to get to know um, his, his work. This is done by oh, what is what is his first name? It's a Troy Little. Artist, right? Yeah, Troy Little. He wrote and drew this, and uh, I want to show you a little bit of the artwork here. Um, this is let me find you. There's a particular page I want to I want to throw up here. I'm sorry, one second. Um, like. Like the the uh, the artwork is just really fun. It's really dynamic. It's really colorful. It's really vibrant. Uh, this is what the cartoon show looked like, and this could have this could easily be an episode. Um, in fact, what I really really like about it is it feels like an extended episode uh, because we know this is going to be a five issue mini series, and I, it, and I hope that it's popular enough that they consider doing an ongoing with it. And um, it it uh, it's a cool it's a cool opening premise. We get a great uh, reveal at the end uh, with Mojo, and I don't mind uh, giving away a little bit about this just because this is kind of the premise the book is built on, so if you've looked at any solicitations, you've seen this already. Uh, the solicitation on this book is basically the, um, the villains of Townsville start uh, uh, kind of trying to turn over a new leaf and become superheroes, and Mojo is the first one of those. And um, what it what, what's cool about it is it's paced in such a way where this feels like it would probably take at least the time as a regular length episode, like 12, like 12, 15 minutes to tell this first issue, but it's just the first part of a five-part arc, and so it's going to feel movie length, I think, when it's done, and I, I love I love how it's being paced, but it's just hilarious. I mean, it opens with the city of Townsville is on fire, and, <laughs> and, then, um, and then the mayor is like, oh no, uh, um, he goes, my big screen TV is on fire, but it's actually just the window, and that's really funny. Anyway, I love the absurdity of Powerpuff Girls, and it really doesn't disappoint. There's this point where uh, Blossom goes, Goes, great Scott. The very next panel is a Scotsman golfer. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, they they, they want to give the Powerpuff Girls uh, I, I, like like um like something special for all the great things they've done for the city, and they reveal that it's golf clubs, and they make them go golfing, and Buttercup's like, oh man, I hate golf, and then later, uh, they fight this big monster in a golf course that looks like Man-Thing with a toupee. Wow. Yeah, it's hilarious. He's got a leaf toupee, and then she's like, I love this game! And I don't know, it's just every every page or two, I laughed out loud at something. And you know, like I said, it's 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 uh, the jokes are, are consistent with the way the show was. Uh, Mojo's voice is consistent with the way he was. Now, if you had told me Craig McCracken wrote this, I would believe you. And um, anyway, I don't know. Just as the big Powerpuff Girl fan I am, I was giddy reading this. I gotta tell you, I was actually in a like like I mean, I was having a good day, but like I was over the moon after I read this. I was in such a good mood the rest of the evening after I, after I read this. That's what that that's what this property ought to be able to do if you like it. 
as much as I do. Anyway, that's that's the end of my gushing. Um, I recommend this hugely to anybody that actually likes Powerpuff Girls, and um, it's hilarious. Highly, highly, highly recommend that. That sounds fantastic. Uh, IDW is tearing it up, huh? Like, oh God, just tearing it up. And they're gonna, they're going to be doing other miniseries for Cartoon Network properties. They've got a Samurai Jack one coming out. So. That excites me a lot. I love Samurai. And I'm not going to get that one because I haven't watched all of Samurai Jack. Um, so like I, I'm not a fan of that show. But that's not to say I didn't like it. I just never watched very much of it. I don't know if I've watched all of it like concurrently all in a row. But I think I've seen all the episodes here and there just as a kid watching reruns and stuff. Yeah, the thing about Samurai Jack was that it was kind of an ongoing story, so I'm pretty sure if you picked up the 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 uh, you know I'm pretty sure if you picked up the comics, you wouldn't really get what was going on if you hadn't watched all of it. But I could be wrong. I don't know. Right. I'm just I think it's a cool world to inhabit and stuff. But uh, I will definitely be getting the Dexter one though. Oh yeah, that's that's a fun show too. I always like Dexter's Lab. Um, um, boy, do I hope that they may, that they that they uh, you know turn at least one of these into a monthly. Yeah, hopefully it sells well. And if not, maybe you could get like a Cartoon Network anthology book or something where you have stories from each of them and you know a big issue or something like that, like what they do with the DC Digital books, at the very least. But yeah, um, yeah. anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the next book I have is uh, Star Wars Legacy number seven. This is uh, continues to be uh, Karina Bacheco and Gabriel Hardman writing with uh, Brian Albert Thies on art. And um, this uh, continues to be really interesting just in uh, how different of a take on the Star Wars universe it is. Um, see, I'm not all that familiar with the legacy era of Star Wars because I didn't read the Ostrander series. So this is always interesting um, for me to inhabit this era of, of Star Wars and see how different it is. Um, I, I'm sure there are some different things revealed in here. Like, there's a lot um, talked about about the Mon Calamari homeworld and their culture and what sorts of things they do, which is, of course, the race that Admiral Ar Akbar arbitrarily is in uh, Return of the Jedi, the fish people, because there's a supporting cast member in here, uh, and he's Tull's best friend, who hails from there, and you find out that the Sith had ravaged and almost genocided their entire people through um, genetic warfare. They put a virus in the planet that wiped out almost that entire species while her friend was off planet. So he's sort of um, has his planet, but not his people. Sort of the reverse Alderaan thing, which is interesting, and they have him dealing with that emotionally. In her. Yeah, it's very cool. And um, we also find some stuff out about Aenea Solo. Some ambiguous things are said about her past, and we find out maybe she has a shadow, more shadowy past than we had thought before. Maybe she had done some bad things in her life that the Imperial government is not happy about, and maybe they're going to have to go after her because of it, which I like is, again, sort of similar to Han Solo. We had met this character midlife, but it was always just sort of assumed that she was this girl who was sort of wet behind the, he wet behind the ears and over her head. She was just kind of this girl that was hanging out, had no direction, didn't know what she was doing for, with her life, but we find out that maybe there's a little bit more to her than that, and I, and I like where the direction that's going. Um, I like all of the, uh, in, of course, the politics of this um, triumvirate government um, trying to walk the line between an authoritarian empire and a republic is just a very interesting juxtaposition to have a government be. And, uh, yeah, this is just continuing to be uh, really interesting. Uh, Star Wars in every sense of the word and that it's a space opera and it has the interesting politics that the prequels tried to have in there but with some real weight and meaning and do, do, do some interesting things with them. I think this is um, Star Wars at its best. Um, it, it has the politics in there but it's not abrasive and uh, overbearing. Uh, there's just so much fun to be had here. Um, it nails the tone completely and uh, continues to surprise me and do new things with uh, these characters I've never met before, too. So, yeah, if you like Star Wars, this is uh, the book to be reading, I would say, out of any of them. I've been saying that since the first issue, but uh, it continues in, in that direction, and I'm really happy about that. I'm going to be really disappointed if this has to... And it be ended prematurely because of the Disney Dark Horse Star Wars comic book Marvel thing that could potentially happen. But I don't know what's going on with that. So I'm just going to keep reading until they, 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 they stop. <laughs> Dan, uh, obviously I'm not a, a Star Wars expert or anything, so don't lynch me for not knowing this before you said it. Did you say that Admiral Akbar's uh, uh, people are called the Calmari? Mon Calmari, yeah. Ma oh, Okay, I wonder. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, you know what, you know what I'm imagining right now. I'm imagining going to a restaurant and, and ordering a an appetizer, 
and it comes to the table, and I reach in, and I'm about to eat a, a, a piece of calamari, and then he pops up, up, up from another from another uh, table, and he goes, "That's a trap! <laughs> That's my daughter." <laughs> Anyway, uh, next up, I've got uh, this. This is the last thing I'm really going to talk about very much. I, I also I did read uh, *Eddie the Hellboy* this week. I'm not really going to review this uh, just because it's more of the same. Uh, it's hilarious. It's a lot of jokes. Uh, it's 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 um, Balthazar and Franco doing Hellboy like uh, like Tiny Titans. This one was a little bit more lost on me than the first one because I don't know these characters that well. So I think that there were a few jokes that kind of went over my head here and there. It's still funny. I enjoyed it, but I'm not going to do a full review on it. Here is uh, *Star Trek* number 25. This is the first part of an art of a four part arc called the Kittimer Conflict. Um, and this is uh, really setting the stage for the Klingon Federation war that was hinted at real hard in the in uh, darkness. Oh, cool. And cool. what we've what we've got here is a conspiracy by some unnamed human that we don't know who it is, or possibly a human group, clearly trying to continue on the work of Admiral Marcus from the evil things that he was doing in his giant black double sized enterprise called <laughs> in Star Trek Into Darkness. And what I, but we don't know who this person is. I'm hoping it turns out to be somebody I've heard of. I think that would be cool. Um, but anyway, uh, you, had the, you, you have uh, him actually conspiring with the Romulans to uh, start a war with the Klingons and um, it, not sabotage anything, but to just defeat them. And so, uh, like, the Enterprise is about to go on its five-year mission. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, they're, they're, uh, I mean, they, like, like, they just keep getting interrupted, Dan. They're like, they're, they're about to go on the mission, and they're finally going to go. There's all this talk about how it's going to be five years before any of them see their families or anything, uh, which is interesting because in TOS it was supposed to be the five-year mission, but they went to star bases and things all the time. So I'm not real sure how that works, but, they, but, uh, they, 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 but at the same time, I think this version almost makes a little more sense. Where it's like, well, if we're going to go into our uncharted space, then how often could we really warp back to Federation territory? Uh, and then anyway, so. Uh, so this begins uh, the Klingons actually taking uh, the, the planet and colonizing Kittimer, uh, which is really kind of exciting. Uh, Kittimer is, of course, if you know, uh, you're, you're a 24th century Star Trek, you're, you're a TNG and beyond, um, and in Star Trek VI and beyond, uh, Kittimer is both the place where Worf's father Moog got killed, and Kittimer is also the place where uh, they signed the peace treaty between the Federation and the Klingons. So it's a very, very important planet. And it's really interesting that uh, we are starting a war in the same place where in uh, prime continuity we got peace with the Klingons. Uh, I think that's kind of cool uh, that, 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 yeah, they're, that's cool. that they're going there. So that, that's kind of neat. Um, there's not a whole lot going on here except uh, just the beginnings of that and some some hokey stuff. Uh, I, we we some new Klingon ships. There's this huge armada that shows up when when Kirk. Basically, what happens is Kirk responds to a distress signal, but it's not really a distress signal because the Klingons wouldn't put out a distress signal. So it's a signal of vengeance, whatever that means. And then uh, and and then Uhura is like, "That's the closest thing the Klingons have to a signal. They must be in trouble." And Kirk wants to impress them with uh, how you know uh, helpful the Federation is and uh, try to put out an olive branch. And Spock intelligently says, uh, "They're not going to respond well to you." all branch cap in there probably just going to <laughs> and so uh, but, but Kirk does it anyway and Kirk basically in this is second season Enterprise Archer man Archer does the same thing with the Klingons and and, uh, and and the exact same thing that Kirk does here with the Klingons he tries to extend an olive branch simply not understanding that the Klingons don't respond well to we're trying to be merciful and helpful to you they don't they don't care and they want to conquer you they're Klingons you know until later and so uh, you know when it happened to Archer he got uh, sent to a frozen Klingon prison planet, uh, which is, uh, in fact, where Nero, where Nero went uh, in the deleted scenes that we were never shown. But there's in the in the, in the first in the first movie, but there's a there's a line in the background about it. So apparently it happened. So anyway, uh, that that plays into this too. Weirdly enough, uh, War of Pente, the, the the prison planet, because. The Klingons, apparently, while they were holding Nero at the prison planet, managed to get the plans for Nero's giant evil ship, the Narada, and they made a whole fleet of tiny ones. Like, really small? 
No, just like oh, half okay. the size, but like yeah, like 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 the Narada if they were the size of like a bird of prey. Oh, okay. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm not understanding what I thought happened in that thing that is barely canonical because it wasn't really in the movie. Um, I <laughs> thought what happened was that Nero got... See, it's so important, <laughs> they shouldn't have cut it out. Um, I thought from that scene and from what's been done in these comic books that Nero uh, got captured, but his ship and his people didn't, and so he ten years later he went back to his ship and his people because his whole crew was still there, and none of them got imprisoned that I knew of. How did the Klingons get a hold of their plans for the Narada? How did that happen? I don't understand that. Anyway, so that's weird, but that's going on. I mean, the whole thing of them having futuristic technology that's better than, than the Federation technology could be interesting. I just don't know how they got it. I also really can't... I really just don't like uh, Klingons with uh, red ridge uh, uh, rings, really. Forehead ridge rings. All right. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's weird. I'm, not, I'm, not real, I'm not real digging that. But uh, anyway, there is some Klingon language in this. I kind of like that. Uh, we, we get some uh, real Klingon language, and they translate it for you, so that's kind of fun. Um, anyway, um, I liked it more than I've been liking the series lately. So it was, it was fun, but goofy, but I'm starting to expect that from this. So. I'd love to have a Star Trek book that felt like the original series um, that I could read monthly. Like, I don't know. I feel like that would be fantastic, but that book doesn't sound like I'd want to read it too much. No, I don't think you'd really care for this. Uh, I, and I, I honestly don't love it, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with it here and there. I pick it up every now and again. Uh, but to be fair, Dan, there, there is plenty of back Star Trek that's decent. So I don't know. Right, exactly. A couple, a couple major major people have had have had a good run. I mean, like like uh, I think there's a um, Peter David run. Really? Oh, I think so. we'll have to check that out because he has oh, done a lot of Star Trek novels. So that would yeah, be remember cool. he's a huge Trek novelist. He's done he's done some some comics, but I think he I think he had an entire run for for DC at one point. I'm not oh, sure. Could be that's wrong. awesome. I'm I gonna have to look that up right after we finish. Yeah. So anyway, uh, all right. Well, that's that's it for me. Do you have anything else, Dan? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, all right, cool. Well, then let's go ahead and pick book of the week, shall we, Dan? Uh, what is your favorite book for this week? Oh, well. Uh, it wasn't as tough of a competition as it was last week. Um, it's still between two things. Uh, I think I'm going to have to go with um, Uncanny Avengers just because this is a book that um, I have been liking, but this was a standout issue. I liked this book a lot um, in all of the grounded human stuff that's going on as well as the cliffhanger and the reveals with Kang. I, I thought this was a great, great issue. Uh, I'm going to give you a runner-up really quick, because obviously the one I'm going to pick is going to be so obvious by the way I reviewed books this week. So my runner-up would be Bane. I was surprisingly happy with that. Uh, oh. But obviously I'm going with Power Up Girls. It was, so <laughs> it was just so much fun. Course, I, I, can't, yeah. I, I can't help it. Yeah, you know, you probably yeah, if, if if you if you don't if you didn't already know how much I love Powerpuff Girls, you probably expect that I would pick like like the deepest thing I I, I read. No, Powerpuff Girls. It was great. Um, <laughs> what was your favorite cover this week, Dan? Cover. Um, I think I'm going to go with the Ivan Reese drawn Ocean Master uh, cover. I just really like. Everything Ivan Reese does, and when he's drawing Aquaman things, he's at his best, in my opinion. So I really, really like this one. See, what's annoying about this is I, I think my favorite cover was also Powerpuff Girls, but I'm going to try to pick something. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm going to go with... I guess I'm going with Doomsday. Yeah, I, fair enough. I mean, that is a great-looking cover. It's a great looking cover. Yeah, what are you gonna do? There's nothing about what's inside, but you know, it was, <laughs> and, and it matched. But as far as art goes, it matched what was inside too, which is nice. I mean, like, true, art, and that has not been true of nearly of, any. of all of them. Yeah, well, it's been true of some of them. The Riddler one oh, has been the cover. Um, that's true, and uh, you know, some of them have. Um, and I tell you what, I just just to be fair, because I want to give credit where it's due. I did not like this book, but this was one of the better lenticular covers. And the reason I'm saying that is because the mask m seems, when you move it, to move independently from the face a little bit. Oh, yeah, I can see that. That's, that does That's look cool. pretty cool. So this is one of... I'm not saying this is one of the best covers necessarily, although it, it looks good. I just didn't like this character, so I don't care. But I, but I, the lenticular bit is probably... Uh, that's probably one of the best ones of those. That's anyway... Nice. Well, that's it for our reviews this week, Dan. Uh, that was fun. I thought this was a great week. Yeah, I, I read a 
a lot of uh, stuff I, that was pretty good. I, I don't think I enjoyed um, nearly as many things like, you know, wholeheartedly as I did last week. I thought last week uh, beat this one, but you know, I was pleased. I, I, I read a lot of stuff I liked. I think. I wish because the order that you read these villain books in doesn't seem to matter hardly at all. Um, at least of all, all the ones that we've that I've read. I don't know about you, but I mean, like, I don't think the order really mattered that much. I would have flipped last week and this week because there were more good ones last week than, than this week. I felt like a lot of the ones I read this week were, were just okay. A, a lot of really kind of substandard and just middle of the road. I feel like the... Um, I mean, they saved a few of the bigger villains for this week, but I feel like they sort of were running on the last leg, especially with um, the Batman villains. I think, like, Bane was the only, like, A-list Batman villain that got a book this week that I can think of, right? Yeah, that's right. I think so, too. I mean, you had Killer Croc. That was about it. Unless it was right. list, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't know why they saved Doomsday. That that one was kind of a throwaway one. Yeah, I and mean, I was kind of surprised like they saved Sinestro for the last week and stuff like that. But yeah. That was weird. Well, anyway, uh, it's time now, folks, for the open forum. If you're watching with us live, thanks so much for uh, sticking with us for the last couple hours. And right now, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to answer your questions or talk about topics that you'd like to bring up. Please keep it comic book related, as always, on this show, uh, because this is all about current comic books. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, ask us questions or uh, give us topics about uh, the comic book industry at large, any of the books that we read uh, this week, anything going on in the comic book world, uh, uh, superhero or otherwise, uh, please Please leave us your comments. We're looking forward to it, and we will talk to you as soon as we start getting some of those. Uh, in the meantime, Dan, it's time for a plug. Tomorrow begins uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. discussions. Uh, I, although I, I, th I think we're just going to call it S.H.I.E.L.D. discussions just so that it, it's not, the title's not so long. But anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> we should uh, call it Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. discussion. <laughs> um, title. You know, it's funny because I've, I've gotten some flack for, for the discussion series as just not being a real, like, exciting-sounding title. I'm like, yeah, but you can tell what it is, you know? Um, I didn't want to be too... too uh, I've never wanted to be too horribly, like, uh, like gimmicky with those titles. But somebody uh, somebody last week was like, you should call it Agents of Geek Evolution. <laughs> and I was like, that's hilarious. I wish I had thought of that. But uh, anyway, so... Discussion. We should call it a battle of words. Make it more but, because we already have Arrow discussions going on, uh, and we've done other discussion series before, I think we're going to call it that. So it's, it's going to be Shield discussions. Uh, we're uh, changing the format up a little bit for the discussion series. We're going to start streamlining them a little bit and uh, having having more of a rigid format. Uh, and I think I think you'll you know, folks will appreciate what we're doing with it. But it's still going to be uh, podcasty, so it's going to be audio only, um, so that you know people can just kind of listen to it and not not have to um, you know stare at our heads or whatever. Because th those shows will be a little bit longer than some of the other things we do. So anyway, uh, we're going to have have a shield discussion starting tomorrow, and then uh, the week of October 9th when Air when Arrow comes out, Eric and I will be back with you for Arrow discussions also. So we're gonna have two of those discussion shows going on. And Dan, I really feel like this time next year we're likely to have like four of these shows going on uh, because Arrow is gonna spin off Flash, and I don't really see not doing one on that show if we're also doing Arrow. And then when this Gotham show starts on Fox, I imagine we'll do one on that too. So. Plus, there's talk of a Peggy Carter spin-off show um, with Marvel, too. I don't know if that will happen, but... Yeah, I don't know. I'm surprised that they're already talking about that this quick. Yeah, me too. I mean, they were talking about it before Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was even on. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean... So, I don't know what that's... It, well, it might... it gangbusters in the ratings, so I guess that improves our chances of seeing that. I mean, she's not necessarily a character that I would have been the first character I choose I would choose for a TV so show, especially since she's also a shield agent. I, I don't know what else there is to say with her. Other yeah, than that's her that's where my reservation is. I'm like, do we really have to have two shield shows running concurrently? There are a lot of fans that don't want shield at all because they'd rather see superheroes on screen. You yeah. and I will talk about that uh, when we do our discussion show. But um, anyway, well, let's see what people are saying in the comments, Dan. Yes. Yes, <laughs> of course. The open forum is yours. Write what you please. <laughs> uh, Dan, what is the best Spider-Man game? The best Spider-Man game? Yes, Jordan Windsor wants to know. Well, let's see. Jordan Windsor. My favorite one is probably like. Uh, Spider-Man 2, the movie tie-in game. I like that game a lot. I like the Ultimate Spider-Man game, too. 
Um, probably one of those two. I, I like those a lot. And the one for the N64 I used to play a lot, a lot as a kid. It was also on PS1. That's a good game as well. I like Spider-Man 2 a lot. Uh, that was one of the first open world games I ever played, and I thought that um, for the time it was fantastic. I mean, obviously we've improved upon that sort of thing now, but you know, it's, it's still it holds up okay. Uh, I like Shattered Dimensions quite a bit. Yeah, Shadow Dimensions is fun, and I do like uh, Edge of Time, too, because the story in that game is fantastic. It's written by Peter David, and it's kind of a riff on what Peter Parker would be like if you remove Mary Jane from his life, and it becomes this evil megalomaniac. Megal I can't say the word, because I'm tired. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh, I can't wait for us to record Shield Destructions now. <laughs> no, no, I'll be fine. But, uh... I, I like the story because it's kind of like, you know, what would happen if, you know, one more day was actually told as an organic story, so. We're going to start recording that. It's going to be 30 seconds of Dan going, Agent, Agent, Colson, Dan. Oh, yes, Colson. Okay. Um, let's see here. I, oh, hey, let's do another Spider-Man question, Dan. Uh, Batman Kicks Ass says, and I can say that because it's his name, says, uh, I want to know what our favorite Spider-Man cover is. That's a great question. Ooh, I have an answer for that off the top of my head, too. Do you? Go ahead. Oh, Amazing Spider-Man number 39, the cover where Green Goblin has Peter tied up with the uh, cable attached to his glider, and his clothes are ripped off, and he's like this. Oh, the yeah. John Romita cover. I love Green Goblin, and John Romita draws the best Green Goblin in the world, so that's my favorite uh, Spider-Man cover of all that's time. cool. Uh, I have a couple. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, the... I don't remember what number it is. It's uh, like the second time uh, Venom was coming back after his first appearance. Um, when I, I want to say he was still being drawn by McFarlane, but I could be wrong. I don't remember. But anyway, it's, it's the cover where... You have a giant Venom face with uh, Spider-Man reflected in his lenses. Oh, yeah, that is a great cover. I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the number either off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, Venom's had a lot of great covers, especially... Um, I like the one that <coughs> Bagley did where it's Venom holding the skull with the Spider-Man mask on it. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Bagley has a lot. In fact, that might the one I just said might be a Bagley cover. I don't. I'm not sure. I forget mm -hmm. now. Um, but McFarlane had some great ones too. And speaking of my uh, the other one I wanted to throw out, even though this is not a great comic book by any stretch of the imagination, but I love McFarlane's Spider-Man number one cover. Oh yeah, the one where he's sitting on the left. Were all yeah. cool, but that one was amazing. Yeah. It was a great cover, and I loved when he did like all the variations on it. Like he did one of him in the black costume. Uh, in that pose, too, and that's one of my favorite things, too. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? Um, what, you guys, hang on, I'm talking. What, no. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, White Batwing says, are you guys going to check out the new She-Hulk ongoing written by Charles Soule? Uh, I hadn't planned on it. Oh, uh, that's... See, if Marvel wasn't putting out a million and six books that I love right now, that would be something I would definitely pick up because I really like She-Hulk. But it's just going to be tough to find a place for any new series on my full list, let alone any new Marvel books. Yeah, we are covered up like mad right now. Dan and I are, are both really at our limit of what we can um, have time to read right now, what what, uh, what our, our pocketbooks will allow. But um, I will, if people if people want, want it to at least be represented on the show when it first come out, I, it comes out, I'll commit to uh, reviewing the first issue just to tell people what it's like. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Uh, it's difficult. That's something that I would like to pick up and trade ideally, but I feel like if I don't pre-order and buy the issues, it's going to get canceled because that's happens to every She-Hulk series. So, it's a it's kind of a conundrum. What else, Geek Night Four? If you guys could bring back anything from the comics to have back in the New Fifty Two, what would it be? I love Sonic the Hedgehog's answer. Uh, he he, right after that, wrote Joker's face. Uh, I love that. <laughs> Um, I I agree with that answer. Uh, anything? Uh, well, I, we all know what Dan's answer is going to be. I I will. I, I would bet anyone a thousand dollars what Dan's going to say. Go ahead, Dan. Wally West, because he's yes! the character. Yeah. Where's my thousand dollars? Um, <laughs> I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, well, 
let's see. There's always the classic uh, Red Robin was a Robin before he was Red Robin. Yeah, I'd like to have pre-52 Tim Drake back. because I How about that. Tim Drake is his real name? How about that? And how about... Uh, See, I don't want to say Barbara Gordon not being able to walk anymore because I'm okay with her getting to a point where she can walk, but I'd love it. I always wanted at least an explanation for it, so I don't know. That's not something from Pre-52 that ever happened, but at least a continuity there. Um, and, all, and, you know, Death of Superman I'd like to have back. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. Because... I'm if sorry. it's I, not or isn't, in, who knows if it's still... Nobody like. knows, but, what, well, I don't... This makes it more confusing! <laughs> anyway... Uh, yeah. Moving right along. Dun, dun, dun. Danny McSweeney, what do you think will happen to Flash after Venom and the Symbiote? Uh, I have had a difficult time speculating on this one. I think he's likely to recede in the background for a while again. I, I just don't want Venom as Flash Thompson to go away. I don't either. Uh, well, what do you think they'll do with him? Do you think they'll do anything with him? I honestly think he, he will become a sometimes supporting character in the Slot Spider-Man book, and, you know, Slot, ever since he took over that book solo, hasn't even been doing anything with, like, some of the major supporting characters where there were big cliffhangers left off of with the Brand New Day era, like with Harry Osborn. There was a big cliffhanger le weighed left at the end of his last arc, or the last arc of that Brand New Day creative team of having, a, a, like, a TV uh, room-esque writing staff on that book, and Slot had, I don't think, even think Harry Osborn showed up from what I can remember reading since then. So I, I have a feeling that uh, Slot is a little concerned with building up Doc Ock's supporting cast. Uh, that I don't think Flash has a place once he's not in Venom anymore, uh, to be honest with you. I don't think they'll do much with him. Uh, HP Video wants to know if either of us uh, have taken a glance at, at manga. I've, I've never been a manga reader. I, I've, I've read maybe a couple of things for characters that I read. You know, I've read a Batman one, but I haven't read much manga. There, there's a great Kiyasa Neo one, uh, but, um, but Child of Dreams, which is pretty famous, but uh, I've not read much else. The only manga I've read is I've read four volumes of the... Uh... Legend of Zelda manga game adaptations that uh, Nintendo and his kids have put out. I've read the A Link to the Past one, the two Ocarina of Time volumes, and the Majora's Mask one. And they're fun. I mean, they're not, like, deep or, like, you know, complexly written. I mean, they're written for, like, an all-ages um, children audience because it's the Legend of Zelda. But, um, you know, they were, they were fun for what they were. I enjoyed them. Uh, so talking the Hedgehog 1, will Gail Simone move to Marvel? That's a great question. Uh, the thing is, they're treating her pretty well right now, it seems like. I mean, like since that crazy fiasco, I think that they're probably going to work really hard to keep her because of the way the fans reacted. Uh, she had a tweet the other day that said, I just had this great meeting with the Batman office, so probably not anytime soon. I mean, I guess she's happy right now. Um, but I'll tell you what my, what my dream would be. Tell me if you agree with this, Dan. My dream is, and, and I've thought of this before, this is not just because of the earlier conversation we were having. My dream is Gail Simone moves to Marvel and gets Spider-Man. That, that, that's, that's my dream. Awesome. It'll never happen, but that's, that's my dream. I think Gail Simone would, do, would, would, would knock it out of the park with Spider-Man. I think that would be fantastic. Um, I think she has a good sensibility for that kind of uh, drama of the, the everyday personal life of a human being, and that's all what Spider-Man is all about, obviously. Gail Simone with him through his paces, you know, there'd be a there'd be a gauntlet, and not the gauntlet, but a gauntlet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, she, uh, you know, she likes to do a lot of, of a lot of really scary horror, creepy stuff, but uh, it's all grounded in a real human being with some with with uh, some levity. You know, you you both laugh and cry when you read a Gail Simone comic, and I think Spider Man is is absolutely the right place for that kind of writing. And I've I've. Uh, heard people say that on Twitter she has said if she went to Marvel that would be the character she'd want to work on. So. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. I just feel like that's an obvious fit. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be too. And uh, if she wants to do it and, uh, you know, after slot leaves, why not? Let's, let's see if we can get her in there. That'd be cool. Uh, infamous Nick 07 Cap has Spawn year made you hate Spawn. <laughs> oh, Oh, man. I, I can't tell you how many times a week I get that question at, at, at this point. And um, the answer is complicated, but I promise I won't go on and on about it. Um, I will probably talk about this some at length when I'm finished with Spawn here about you know my experience with doing the, 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 
the, the biggest and most time-consuming project I have ever done, and also the most experimental thing I've ever attempted. Uh, there was, I will say this, there was a point in while I was working on Spawn Year a few months ago where I seriously thought I might, when it was all finished, sell my entire Spawn collection when the whole thing was over. Uh, and it has, it has made me like the character in the writing less, but ultimately it's actually turned me into more of a collector of it, which is weird, and I haven't been able to reconcile this yet. Uh, but it, but that, that is what's going on. Um, I tell you what, man, like, I, I still, I love the premise and I love some of the characters, but... Uh, Every time I write the word continuity in an episode of Spawn Year, I cringe because there's not one, and it, it, it's just it's just so funky uh, the the way that book was written. So yeah, um, kinda. I you know I used to think I, I used to uh, think that I loved that character, and I clearly just didn't know enough about it. Um, and uh, now that I know more than I ever guess I wanted to, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, a little bit. I have to. I have to be perfectly frank about it. Uh, it, it has made making that show uh, entertaining really challenging. Um, it's 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 been a good challenge. Uh, but I got to tell you, man, so much of the of the writing in that book. I don't mind going ahead and going on record to say this even before it's over. So much of the writing in that book is so all over the place, lazy, not not good storytelling. And I've had to read so much of it that. I have worried all year long about it kind of dulling my brain and making me not as good of a reviewer, making me less sharp, you know? And um, I'm going to be detoxing when this thing is over. Uh, Spawn Year is a lot of the reason, in case people are wondering, uh, why I haven't put out very many rewinds this year. Not just because it's so time-consuming, but because I have worried about not writing um, as as uh, as good of episodes of, of, uh, of rewind that I would, like, miss things because my senses have been a little bit dulled having to read so much, I hate to say it, schlock. Uh, and, and so that, that has been the most difficult and, uh, and um, you know, uh, complicated thing about, um, about doing Spawn Year, about doing something so ridiculously experimental. But the thing that's gotten me through it is um, just the, the creativity of writing the story for it, which has been a lot of fun. Um, and now I have a Spawn suit, which is cool. Uh, but anyway, so. Well, I'm not surprised to see hear you say that. I mean, I feel like anybody just, you know, reading the same continuity or the same thing over and over again every day for a year might make you get a little bit sick of it, let alone if it's not good. <laughs> oh, uh, Manos is reviewing She-Hulk, so at least one of us is doing it. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, Divid22 said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll put this out real quick. I, I don't want to go on about this. Divid22 says uh, Spawn is about the art. Yeah, it is, and the problem is I'm a story reviewer, and also the thing keeps pretending like it's about stories, so, you know, I, I don't know how else to review it. Like, you know, if, I, I guess I could have gotten to a point where I just said, okay, so here's what happens, doesn't make any sense, the art's pretty, the end, <laughs> you know, and that would have been, that would have been the yeah. show if I completely took that at face value, yeah, so I don't know. Um, always tough. <clears throat> so people are asking questions here about, um, one of the teasers that Marvel recently put out, and it looks like SWAT yeah. and Mike Allward are going to be getting a Silver Surfer book. What do we oh. think about that? Okay, don't don't lynch me. Okay, really, like don't throw things at me, Dan. Could work. I don't see his voice working for that character in a way that I would enjoy it at all because he's all about comedy, and Silver Surfer isn't. I mean, like. Maybe he can do some unintentional comedy when you read some of the Stanley dialogue and it's so, like, you know, on the nose, like, I am the Silver Surfer, like that kind of voice. But I, I, I don't know. It's I, not just, I just don't care for that kind of style, you know, where it's know. on the nose, I, goofy, not telling a story just for the gags kind of thing. Yeah, I, I get that. But, what, but I guess the thing is, if he did it deliberately as a comedy, I think you could do a Silver Surfer comedic book. I think it could work. Um, I don't know that that's what he'll do with it. He'll probably do it like Spider-Man, where it is that, but he's not aware of it, uh, which is just how I felt about And I'm sorry for folks that love that book. It's just how I feel about it. Um, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that I want that or that I'll even probably read it, but I don't know. If he, if he intentionally made it, if I, I, I guess what I'm saying is if he did a cartoon, little kid, kind of jokey Silver Surfer book, it could work, but that's not what it'll be, so... 
Right, I mean, if he was writing the Superhero Squad Silver Surfer, that'd be awesome. But other than that, really... <laughs> that's his Silver Superhero Squad Silver Surfer's fantastic. He's he sounds like a surfer dude. It's great. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily need like hard science fiction in Silver Surfer. I was just wanted something that's a little bit more like space opera adventure kind of thing. But you know, uh, let's do one or two more real quick. Uh, dun dun. Da -da -da. You know, if we can... Son of the Hedgehog 1 is asking a lot of really cool questions, but we already answered one of his, so I was trying to look at some other ones. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we have anything else. Um, White Batwing asks, would you guys read a Teen Titans book after Forever Evil that consists of the original team, i.e. Wally West slash Dick Grayson, etc.? Um, I, don't, I don't know know that it makes sense to put Characters that are not teens on a Teen Titans book, but yeah, Grayson's like twenty five. <laughs> also, it would never happen, but you know. Yeah, I mean, like putting all those characters in a book and having them, you know, be a team that might be fun. Adult Titans. Yeah, I mean, if they just called it Titans, maybe. Post Teen I mean, Titans. Like, is there a pl is there a plan to break up the Teen Titans or something? I don't follow that book at all because it's written by Scott Lobdell, but. Yeah. For people that are reading it, is is that a thing? Like, are the Titans yeah, I don't know. Up? I don't know. They were in Forever Evil for, like, two pages, and I was like, oh, look, it's the Vulture, I mean, Tim Drake. And then, you know, they kind of moved on. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there were, you know, there have been books in the past called Titans, so they could totally get away with that. But... Right, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thanks, as always, for uh, watching the Comic Vault. Thanks for uh, joining us live, if you're watching live, and uh, for those of you watching this later on, thanks for tuning in also. And uh, we'll be with you again next week, Thursday night, 7 p.m. PM Central Time. And then on Friday, uh, we'll be putting out new episodes of uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. discussions, talking about the uh, uh, previous week's episode, or the, that week's episode, uh, after it airs on Tuesday. Anyway, uh, I want to thank, as always, Elite Comics for helping us out with the show out here in Kansas City. Uh, if you're ever out in the Kansas area, be sure and check out Elite Comics. Uh, it is a fantastically fun store, and um, that's where I get all my comic books, and they're very helpful with our show. So thanks to them. Dan, thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me, as always. I had a fantastic time. We'll see you later. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> Happy reading! <laughs>